Okay, here we go with uh, radiology board review. So x-rays were discovered in 1895 by Wilhelm Conrad Rentgen, and this is also why early x-rays were also known as Rentgen rays. He named it x-ray because he didn't know what it was about, and they used to replace anything they didn't know or understand or an unknown uh, in algebra, they replace it with X, right? So X-ray, unknown. It was discovered when he was experimenting with a cathode ray tube. Um, and then the very next year, uh, they took the very the first dental radiograph, and that was in 1896. So we're going to go through the fundamentals of radiation and we're going to talk about particulate radiation. So radiation is the emission or propagation of energy through space. Particulate radiation is when tiny particles of matter that possess mass and travel in straight lines at high speeds. These are electrons, beta particles, cathode rays, protons, alpha particles, and neutrons, right? And radiation is kind of particulate radiation and other type of radiation, which is electromagnetic radiation. This one is propagation of radiation or wave-like energy without mass through space or matter. These are going to be X-rays, cosmic rays, UV rays, visible light, infrared light, radar waves, waves, microwaves, and radio waves. They are going to vary in energy, and they can be ionizing or non-ionizing. It is believed that they move through space as both a particle, a photon, and a wave. Next slide. So, so they x-rays the x-rays that we take they are both particulate radiation and electromagnetic radiation here is that spectrum uh, where we see you know different types of x-rays here this right here is going to be where x-rays fall in the spectrum um, gamma rays are obviously more intense uv rays this is where we can be burned by the sun right and then this right here is visible light um, this line right here is probably ionizing radiation so everything this way over can ionize and everything this way down cannot some of the fundamentals here um, is that if it is left of the visible rays this line right here left of that one it has longer wavelengths and it has lower frequencies and right of the visible light is going to be x-rays they have shorter wavelengths resulting from tungsten target being hit with accelerated um, electrons in a vacuum and higher frequencies so everything from this way forward as you can see just from this image the wavelengths get shorter and shorter and wavelength which we'll talk about but wavelength is the distance from the crest of one wave over to the crest of the next wave This one is the electromagnetic spectrum. So here we can see you know, infrared rays, uh, light, ultraviolet rays, uh, very soft x-rays, x-rays that don't do anything, <laughs> uh, x-rays and gamma rays, and then you know, it continues on. Um, but again, we're, we're mostly worried about uh, the more like higher intensity um, x-rays that can, that can ionize. So fundamental concepts of radiation, we have the wave concept. Um, and in this one, we're talking about velocity. It's the speed of the wave um, and it, it travels at the speed of light. And then wavelength is always going to be the distance between one crest of one wave and the crest of the next wave. Realistically, it doesn't have to be the crest. It just has to be the similar point in the wave. So if it's the valley of one wave to the valley of the next wave, it's it's essentially the same thing. But the idea is just that, you know, if you have a wavelength, then it's it's, you know, one point to that same point on the next um, 
wave and the distance between the two. And then a shorter wavelength means that there's, there's less distance here and it's going to have a higher energy and it's going to be more penetrating or harder. Um, it just means that it's going to be able, because it has more power, it's going to be able to go through more dense objects. And then the frequency is the number of wavelengths that pass a given point in a certain amount of time. So when we talk about maybe the distance between, um, you know, the, the target in the tungsten, uh, the tungsten target that's inside our tube head, and then the film receptor, the frequency is going to be the number of wavelengths that we can get to be in that amount of distance. Fundamentals of radiation wavelength, the definition, again, distance in a periodic wave between two points of corresponding phrases. So this is what I was talking about there. It doesn't have to be the crest of one wave to the crest of another wave. It can be the valley of one wave to the valley of another, just as long as they're the same points on the wave. So it's essentially, if, if you just keep with the crest of one wave to the crest of the next wave, you're totally fine. And this is what that looks like, the crest of this one to the crest of this one, or you, it says trough, or you could use valley, it doesn't matter what word you use, but the valley of this one to the valley of this one, the distance here between the two, that's the wavelength. The frequency are the number of crests that pass uh, per unit of time. This YouTube video, um, I watched it. I mean, it, it's a cool way to visualize. It's a little bit older of a video, um, so you gotta, you gotta be a little patient with that, but it's, it is good information. Fundamentals of radiation. A light wave, um, is it, so as far as light goes, is it a wave or is it a stream of particles? And the idea here is that no one really knows. Uh, it's age old debate, exhibits characteristics of both. So we don't know for sure which it is. Um, and so we sort of subscribe to both theories that it is both a wave in you know electromagnetic radiation and a stream of particles for particulate radiation. Um, so particle theory came from Isaac Newton, and then the wave theory or electromagnetic theory came from Maxwell. So that's what you need to, I guess, get, take from that. And this is going to describe wave-like properties of all electromagnetic radiation, not just light. So electromagnetic radiation properties are going to be expressed best by the wave theory and quantum theory. So in electromagnetic radiation, the wave theory has to do with how radiation is propagated into the form of waves. Um, just a caveat, no one expects you to become a physicist in order to review for your board exam. So don't, don't worry about this as much. The idea here is just that you understand how you know, electromagnetic radiation is created and how it is expressed. And that kind of helps you understand x-rays a little bit better. It's useful when considering radiation in bulk because millions of quanta, quanta is just like a little bundle of energy that are being looked at at one time. So you have electric and magnetic fields that are oriented in planes to one another. So you can see here that kind of the vertical plane is uh, electromagnetic and then the uh, left and right plane is the electric field. And when we talk about electromagnetic radiation and each of the waves, they will travel in any number or you know any variable of these types of waves. Also that they oscillate perpendicular to the direction of motion. Yeah, you don't really, this, this is extra. Um, the quantum theory here is that electromagnetic energy described as bundles of energies are called photons. And this is the word you're going to need to know, photons. Um, the idea here is that a photon is a bundle of energy, which actually also makes it a quantum. Each one, more than one quantum is a quanta, by the way. Uh, so it's successful in relating or correlating experimental data. It has an interaction of radiation with atoms, photoelectric effect, and the production of x-rays. 
x-rays is what's most important to us. The idea here is that the uh, energy that is created is called a photon and it travels in waves. Um, ionization. So this one is important. Ionization is very key in understanding x-rays and how they work for us. So most atoms are neutral. That means they have the same number of protons as they do electrons. And then we're over here in this image. So you can see that all of these little blue sort of balls are, there's the same number of them as there are of the uh, protons which are inside the nucleus of the atom, right? And there's also the neutrons that also live there in the nucleus and the neutrons are neutral. The idea here though is that because each of them has a charge, the electrons that are in the shell on the outside are negative and then the uh, protons that are on the inside are positive if it loses or it gains an, an electron, then the atom itself will take on a whole new charge. It will become either negatively charged if it has more electrons than protons, or it will become positively charged if it loses an electron. And if it loses it, then it means it has more protons than electrons. So atoms lose an electron and an ion pair is going to be created. So the electron that falls off, right, that one's going to become a negative ion. And then the atom, which is left and is missing some uh, electron, either one or, or more, it's going to have more protons than it does electrons, so it's going to be positive. So the, the um, atom here becomes a positive, um, the proton becomes positive ion basically. Um, so whenever it loses or it gains, it's going to change the charge of the atom and it's going to become an ion. So ionizing radiation, therefore, is radiation that is capable of producing ions. This is why we always talk about energy and how you know, how powerful the x-rays are. If they're powerful, then they're going to be able to create more of these ions, which essentially we want. We want to be able to create ions in order to be able to take x-rays. Um, but ionizing radiation is also inherently dangerous. Going backward, photon. This is an elementary particle responsible for electromagnetic phenomena. Um, it's, it's how electromagnetic energy, it, it's the thing that travels in the electromagnetic energy. Uh, it is the carrier of electromagnetic radiation of all waves. So gamma, x-ray, UV, visible, infrared, microwave, and radio. Um, it's going to differ from electron and from quark. That's the first time I've seen that word, in that it has zero rest mass. It, it doesn't ever stop and still be a thing. If, if it's traveling, it's energy that's traveling forward, but it never stops. It doesn't have mass. It travels in a vacuum and at the speed of light, and it has both wave and particle properties. Okay, so let's talk about the different types of radiation um, as in terms of like primary, secondary, and scatter. So first up, we have primary, and this is going to be the x-ray beam that exits the tube head. I didn't um, edit this because it's the same uh, PowerPoint that you guys get from your uh, book. So this, there's gonna be typos. So this is the X-ray beam that exits the tube head. The secondary radiation is the radiation that is created when the primary beam interacts with matter, and we'll talk about interaction. And then scatter radiation, this one's very important. We talk about it a lot is the form of secondary radiation. It is a type of interaction where second, the primary beam interacts with matter. And it's the X-ray that has been deflected from its path by the interaction with matter. So it's traveling along and then it hits maybe an atom here and it's gonna get deflected off. And then in the interaction of matter uh, or the interaction of X-rays, four separate things can happen. One, the x-ray can pass through the patient. This is 
the one that we want to happen for our x-rays. So we want the x-ray to travel through all the way to the sensor. We don't necessarily want it to get absorbed or blocked or anything like that because then it doesn't charge the crystals or it doesn't you know, charge the sensor uh, in order to create the black appearances that we see on our x-rays. So the ones that go all the way through will turn the sensor areas black. And then the x-ray that can be uh, completely absorbed by the patient. So it hits an atom and the atom just absorbs that energy, but it doesn't have enough energy to you know, continue or be scattered or anything like that. The x-ray can be scattered. So we have scatter radiation where it can hit the atom and then it will go a different direction or uh, like the photon itself will go a different direction or it can hit the atom and then uh, in being transmitted it will hit the atom it will cause an electron on that atom to break off and travel in a different direction light can have four face fates when it hits tissue so one it can be absorbed this is the primary and beneficial effect of laser energy why are we talking about lasers uh, reflected, the beam can be re, uh, redirected itself off the surface and have no effect on the tissue. It can be scattered, so it can harm surrounding tissues, or it can be transmitted. It, can, it still may harm surrounding tissues. Laser energy directly through tissues. Hmm. I guess here they're talking about like laser, which is a, essentially electromagnetic radiation to a certain degree. Um, so, I mean, it can have any of these four interactions. One, it gets absorbed. Two, it gets, um, no, I'm sorry. One is that it would travel through and not harm the tissue. Two is that it would be absorbed. Three, would that it would be reflected or scattered. And four is that it would be transmitted. Okay, so the types um, of radiation here that we talk about, they are going to be bremstralung, which is produced by sudden slowing or stopping of the electrons toward a target. This is the primary source of x-rays. So when you see this word bremstralung, you're also going to think of the word breaking. And it means that when the x-ray uh, electrons they leave the cathode and they travel over to the anode they hit or they crash into the tungsten target that's in the anode and when that happens that sudden like crash that is going to create energy and that is going to create those photons the negatively charged electrons directed towards the anode charged source is going to have a loss of velocity. So the electrons are traveling over towards the anode and when they crash into it, they lose velocity, but they also create uh, photons. And then characteristic radiation, this is a very minor source of the radiation. This is the electrons that from the filament will displace an electron from the shell of the tungsten target atom and the atom ionizes. So like how we talked about before where it becomes an atom, the electrons traveling over from the cathode to the anode will create an ion there and that ion will travel along. National board question. A radiograph produced from the movement of an electron from an outer shell to a vacancy in an inner shell is referred to as Thomson Thompson scatter, Bremstralung radiation, characteristic radiation, or particulate radiation. That one is going to be considered characteristic radiation. Properties of x-rays. So the characteristics, invisible, uh, no mass, and they have no weight. You can't feel them as much as your patient's they, they say they can feel them, they can't. They travel in a straight line at the speed of light. Um, in, in this, they travel in one direction kind of thing, like a straight line. They do travel in waves, so they'll have shorter waves will be a higher frequency. 
um, hard x-rays. This is interesting. These are um, like more powerful, shorter, um, and they have the ability to penetrate more dense uh, structures. Soft x-rays are have longer, so they'll have longer wavelengths, they'll be less penetrating, and they're more likely to be absorbed into the tissues. This is something we actually don't really want with x-rays, um, so we try to like filter these guys out. Um, penetration is the, the how they pass through matter or be absorbed by matter, depending on the atomic uh, anatomic structure of the matter. So I guess uh, so the tooth, depending on the tooth as far as how dense it is, or the you know restorations or anything like that, if they're not able to pass through, the X-ray doesn't have enough penetrating power, then it won't be able to go through and it won't travel it will be absorbed basically so it won't ever make it to the film or the sensor and it won't turn that area black so that area will either be white or like very light gray and then if the x-ray has enough penetrating power it will travel through structures which are probably less dense and then it will make it to the sensor or the film and it will turn that area black this is uh, produces an image on a photographic film. So that's what we're talking about there. And it will cause ionization. The distance, oh, so here we talk about the inverse square law. Remember that part where I was like, if it's um, you know two times the distance away, hang on, let me erase this. So if it's two times the distance, let's say you started with one inch and now you have two inches right so you would take two inches and you would square it so you would get four and then you would find the inverse of that so instead of it being four whole you would put in so instead of all, all numbers all whole numbers are like four over one right so you would find the inverse which would be one fourth that inverse square law there tells us that if we doubled our distance, we went from one inch to two inches, our intensity or the penetrating power of our beam is going to only be one fourth of the intensity that it was at one cent or one inch. So at, you know, anytime you double the distance, you're going to have one fourth of the amount of penetrating power and intensity of the beam. All right, so when we talk about image characteristics, we're going to be talking about three separate things. We're talking about the sharpness of our image, or like the definition, your ability to see the edges or the outlines of every object you're looking at. We're going to talk about distortion. So is the, the image the same shape and outline and well, essentially just shape as the object that we were trying to capture and is it the same size so magnification we're going to talk about all three things sharpness distortion and magnification first is sharpness and this one relates to the distinct and sort of sharp demarcation demarcation always means border of the image elements here we're talking about the focal spot size, and this is the focal spot, uh, which is the tungsten target that is inside the anode. So if you have a large focal spot or a large tungsten target, then your image isn't going to be as sharp as it will be if you have a smaller focal spot or smaller tungsten target. Then there's film composition. So what is the film made of? Uh, if it has the smaller silver halide crystals, you're going to get a sharper image. In the same way as like with pixels, if you have you know a 720 pixel, uh, you're not gonna get as sharp of an image as you will if you have the 1080 pixels, right? The larger the pixels are, the less sharp of an image. So the smaller the pixel, the more sharp, right? Same, same thing applies with crystals. 
and then movement of film or the patient during exposure. Obviously, if they move around, you're going to get a blurry image. So it says that the sharpness is going to be influenced uh, by the PID length. That's not necessarily true. With, with PID length, you're talking about magnification. Uh, the type of films, this one 100%, yes, is uh, going to play a role in the sharpness. And then the use of intensifying screens, this is more so for uh, panoramics, which um, you know isn't isn't necessarily um, that doesn't really necessarily mean anything for the blurriness. Okay, so penumbra is the word that you needed to remember. With any type of blurriness or unsharpness, we're talking about the word penumbra, and this is. Well, like I told you before in radiology, if it's a weird word and you've like never seen it before, it sounds made up, it's probably going to be on your board exam. So Bremstra long radiation, you'll probably see it. Penumbra, you'll probably see it. Um, when it comes to the source of the radiation, this is where we're talking about the tungsten target. The If it is a large tungsten target, then you're going to have more penumbra. Penumbra is blurriness, right? So if you have a large target, then you're going to have more penumbra. If you have a, a smaller tungsten target or focal spot, then you're going to have less penumbra. These other two, source to object distance and object to film distance, both of these are actually talking about magnification, not fuzziness. So this whole thing up, this is all penumbra. I don't know why your book decided to not even use the word magnification, but it didn't. So um, source to object distance. If we have a long distance away, we're going to have less penumbra. It, it says penumbra, but it should be magnification. And if it has a short distance, it will have, it says, uh, more penumbra, but this will be more magnification. And we don't want magnification, right? We want it to be the same size as it, like we want the image of our tooth to be the same size as the tooth. So we want to be further away as far as our tungsten target to the object. Tungsten target to tooth, we want that to have some distance in order to reduce magnification. In lab, this was where I put my hand in front of the screen. And remember how if I took my hand and got closer to the overhead projector that it made my uh, hand's shadow look bigger? We don't want that. We want the shadow of the tooth to be the same size as the tooth. The other point here is the object to film distance. So we want the film or the sensor to be all the way right up against the tooth or as close as we can get it. The closer we get the film or the sensor to the tooth, the less magnification, which we don't want magnification, right? The less magnification we'll have. So this one, check mark, we want that. That is good. Less magnification. So Essentially, you want your tube head to be farther away from the person, right? However, the further away you get, the less intense your beam is, right? And we don't want to be too far away that we don't have an intense enough beam. And we don't want to be so close that we are having magnification. So the sweet spot is going to be the long PID. So a, I believe it's 16 inch PID is going to be the best distance away in order to keep your beam nice and intense, but to be far enough away to avoid magnification. And then when we, when we have that magnification, uh, as far as the, the sensor up against the tooth, because in order to get parallel, we're going to have to move slightly away. We're going to have to sit the sensor up inside the mouth, and it's not going to be all the way up against the tooth, right? So whenever we have to push that sensor away slightly from the tooth, that's also why we want to pull that PID to that long distance away so that we can reduce the magnification on both sides. Because 
moving the sensor to be parallel is going to create some magnification, which we don't want. So we move our tube head slightly away to make up for the difference. Image characteristics, sharpest image with least distortion. You want to have a nice small focal spot. Uh, magnification wise, you want a short object to film distance. Uh, magnification wise, you want uh, the the distance between the source, the tungsten target, that's why it says target, uh, to film to be a little further away. Um, you want the film and the tooth to be parallel, right? That's why we're having to make our distance a little bit longer so that we can have a parallel uh, film to tooth. And then you want the beam to be perpendicular. This one is going to reduce distortion. Remember in this one, we talked about perspective and how if you looked down on something um, that it would look shorter, but if you had to look up at something, it would look tall, right? If you had like a building and you were in a helicopter looking down on it, the buildings all look small, right? But if you are a tiny ant looking up at a building, you're probably seeing, you know, you, you can't even see the whole thing. It's so big, right? So with your beam, you want your beam to come in perpendicular to the tooth and to the film. Here, wait here, let's draw a tooth. You want your beam to come in perpendicular to the tooth and to the film so that you don't have any of that distortion because you want your image to be the same shape as the object. Okay, so other image characteristics. Uh, you are never going to get away from it, density and contrast. So density is the overall darkness or lightness of our image, right? In this image that you can see here on this page, that's a pretty dense image. That's a little, a little too much density there. The more photons that you have, so the more penetrating power, the more um, intensity that you have with your beam, the more density you'll have. It will penetrate through the structures more effectively and reach the sensor and it will turn the sensor black. This is going to be influenced by the film type that you have, if it's very sensitive or if it's not very sensitive, uh, the speed of your film, right? Uh, usually with, with um, digital, you don't have to worry about this. The processing, so if you overdevelop your film, right? Remember the developer, turns things black, it turns the, the energized silver halide crystals into black metallic silver. The longer it sits in the developer, the darker it will get. The exposure time, so the more time it has x-rays flying toward it, uh, the more of those x-rays are going to penetrate through and get to the sensor. So the exposure time has to do with your MA settings, right, milliamperage. That one has to do with how many x-rays you are pointing towards your, your um, tube head or, you know, that. The PID length, so the further away, remember we talked about intensity, the further away we are, the less intense our beam is, so we will have less density. So the closer we get, the more intense it is, and we'll have darker image. KVP settings, this is this is it right here. KVP settings is all about the speed of the beam, the speed of those photons and the penetrating power that they have. So KVP, this one is all about the quality of the beam and how, uh, you know, how good of a beam it is. And then last is source to object distance. So, uh, you know, if we, it, with our longer PID, the further I get away we get, then the, um, the less intense the beam is and the less density we'll have. When it comes to contrast, this one is what we're talking about, the variations of gray and between white and black. So with contrast, if there is a big difference between two adjacent colors, so like let's say you have, you know, um, you have like white, you have light gray, you have gray, you have dark gray, and then you have black, right? These 
are going to be very different from one another if you have then if you have white then you have very light gray and then you have light gray and then you have a little less light gray and then you have like plain gray and then you have like a little bit darker gray and then like a little bit darker than that gray and then a little bit darker than that gray and then a little bit darker than that gray and then like the darkest gray and then black okay that is going to have a lot less contrast between these two different colors than it will between these two different colors okay so how sharply light and dark areas are separated from one another if you were to line up all those colors all in a row from lightest to darkest how sharply different are the two colors next to one another it's influenced by the patient size so if our patient is um you know a very small you know maybe child then they're going to have um the x-rays will penetrate through those substance or surfaces anatomical structures uh, more easily and they're going to make more gray areas on um the x-ray whereas if you have you know a very dense uh, structure that you're trying to go through uh, so you have like maybe a, a large individual who has you know like a lot of uh, muscle and bone then they will not have those structures penetrated quite as uh, as easily and then they will have uh, more areas of gray the film type that you're using so if you have a uh, high-speed film versus a slower speed the processing again depending on how long you've left it in the developer the film storage this one for film storage this is if you're storing it in the room with chemicals because then um, it can create some fog on your film so you don't want to store your film in the same place that you use chemicals basically and then mainly kvp so kvp has to do with the penetrating power if you have a very high kvp it's going to penetrate a lot of structures so you're going to get more shades of gray think of high kvp a lot of gray low kvp means that you're going to have less shades of gray so it's going to be mostly black and white mostly black and white means you have a lot of contrast mostly gray means you don't have a lot of contrast so contrast and kvp are inverse it's the only one that's inverse so with contrast if you have high kvp kvp you will have low contrast and vice versa Ugh man handwriting is rough and then with density if you have high kvp you're going to have high uh, high density if you have high ma you're going to have high density if you have a high exposure time you're going to have a high density density goes with everything high kvp high density high milliamperage high density high exposure time high density contrast is special contrast is inversely related and it only kvp of your settings will matter okay kvp is inversely related with contrast this one we're talking about the scale remember we talked about like uh we made the step wedge and in this one if there is a high contrast it means that you don't have a lot of differences between the colors so you're going to have a short scale if we think of scale as like the number of steps it takes to go from white to black then it's it's not a lot of steps there it's going to be short scale versus if i have a lot of different shades of gray oh man i drew on the picture before i even knew the picture was going to be there um if you have a lot of um, shades of gray see here like there's there's a whole lot more gray in this bottom image than there is on top so I'm gonna it's gonna take me a long time to be able to label off all of those shades of gray so it's gonna take me a long time low contrast means there's you know not very different in one color to the next means it's gonna take me a long time to 
you know, get from white to gray. Many shades of gray has low contrast and it takes a long time. Like less shades of gray, fewer shades, so it's mostly black and white, is high contrast, but it's there's not a lot of steps there. Um, this one, again, contrast, only really has to do with KVP. So the higher the KVP, the lower the contrast. Inversely, the lower the KVP, the higher the contrast. Here are some of those features. So MA has to do with the number of photons. They'll also call, call this the quantity. Quantity. Um, so the more uh, milliampere you have, the more photons you have, the more quantity, and the higher the density. The more exposure time you have, again, more photons means more quant. Oops, hang on. Back to the pencil. Quantity. Quant. Uh, and also more density. But neither one of these has anything to do with the contrast. KVP, this one's important. The more KVP you have, the more photons you have, and the more penetration that they have. So this one, this is the only one that has to do with the quality of the beam. Quality. This is the only one that deals with this. So KVP is super important. If you remember, KVP has to do with the quality, and the quality has to do with how you know powerful uh, the beam is. Then you're you're set. You got it. Um, in this one again, it, the more KVP you have, the more density you have. And this one is the only one that has anything to do with contrast. So the more KVP you have, the lower contrast, and the less KVP, the higher the contrast. Then we're getting into aluminum filtration. These are these little discs that we put between the tube, inside the tube head, and where the beam exits. And the idea here is to remove some of those weaker photons, right? We don't want those less intense ones that are just going to get absorbed. We nobody needs that, right? It's not they're never going to make it. There's no point. So, the more we remove these slow weak um x-rays, the less density we're going to have, right? So, in it, basically, we're removing photons from the overall number that are traveling towards the sensor. And so essentially, you're going to re you know, release some of that density. The idea here, too, is that you'll have a long scale, many shades of gray, low visual contrast. Because we're getting rid of all of those slow, weak ones, um, we're going to have more shades of gray. And then in the distance increase, so the further away we get with our tube head from the person, then we're going to have less photons. Remember our inverse square law, it means we'll have a less intense beam and we're gonna have less density. All right, so the two most important words that you'll need to remember walking in uh, to your board exams are gonna be radiolucent and radiopaque. Right. Remember, I think of radiopaque as being black is white. Right. Radiopaque is white. So radiolucent are the portions of your radiograph that are dark or black. These are the areas that allowed x-rays to pass through them. And the x-rays went from the tube head through the tissue all the way to the film. Didn't get hung up by the tooth here in the middle. Right. There's a tooth. Airspace, soft tissue, these are the areas that are mostly radiolucent. Radiopaque areas are the area that is light or white. Okay, these are the areas where they were so dense that they didn't allow the x-rays to pass through. They actually absorbed the x-rays. These areas are like enamel, dentin, bone, and metals. All of this is relative. So if you have a radiopaque structure and they ask you which one is radiopaque, they're probably asking you which one is the most radiopaque of the structures that you have. If 
you know, any of them you feel will slow down or stop the passage of x-rays because they are dense, then they are going to be radiopaque structures. But we all know that bone is much less dense than metal, right? Metal is going to be more radiopaque. So make sure when you're looking at these things or you're, you know, you're reading those questions, you're reading them carefully to figure out, you know, what they're asking for. Light, or are they asking for black areas or are they asking for white areas? And how do the, you know, the choices that they give you, which one is the most like what they are asking you for? Magnification, we already talked about it, but it's how big the actual uh, image is in com or how big the object is in comparison to how big it is on your picture. And if you decrease the object to film distance, then you will decrease the magnification. If you increase the target to film, the longer the PID, then you will uh, decrease your magnification. Distortion has to do with the shape of the object being radiographed. I guess at some point they figured out they were, they, you know, goofed earlier in this in the slideshow. If I were editing the slideshow, I probably would have just took those other slides out. Um, the variation here is of the true size and shape. Shape right here is the most is the most important when it comes to distortion, and it has to do with the the shape that you see from the beam, right? It has an unequal magnification of different parts of the same object, and it results from the improper angulation of the X-ray beam. In order to minimize the distortion, you want your object and your film to be parallel, and you want your X-ray beam to come in perpendicular, right, at a right angle. So here is your object, here is your film, and you want your beam to come in and create those two little right angles, right? Think about it like this. If you were looking at this cube, right, and you're looking at it straight on, you might see something like a cube, right? Hang on, let me try to draw a cube with my mouse. This is interesting. And then let's say you came at it, like this is you straight on. This is, this is perpendicular, okay, 90 degrees. Now let's say you were looking at it from up top, right? You would probably see something more like this right here. And then let's say you were looking at it from underneath, right? So you would probably see something more like this. Right? Because you're looking at it from underneath. You're, not, you're probably not even going to see the top. These three things don't look the same. They're not the same shape. The outline of them is different. That is distortion. So in order to minimize that, you need to come in straight. You need to look at it perpendicular. Okay, sharpness has to do with the focal spot size, the film composition, and the movement. Oh, I love this chart because it's just everything I talked about earlier and the other slides were just so wrong and I was so upset about it and now it's all, everything is right in the world. Um, so here, when we have a, a focal spot, this, the size of our tungsten target inside the anode, this smaller focal spot will give us better sharpness. That's what we want. The film composition, we want the smaller crystals, will give us more sharpness. And for movement, we want less movement in order to have a nice sharp image. And again, with sharpness, we're talking about this P word, penumbra. There we go. Uh, magnification. Here we're talking about distance. So how far away is our target, the anode target, the, the tungsten target in the anode, to the film? And we're talking about how far away is the tooth from the film. So the further away we get our PID, the less magnification we'll have. We want less magnification, right? And the further or the closer we can get our object to our film, so how, how you know close we can get the film to the tooth, the less magnification we have. When it comes to distortion, we're talking about, well, this says alignment, but they should have used the word angulation. So the angulation for the, um, the object, the tooth 
and the film, we want that to be parallel, right? Object and film parallel. So we have less distortion. And we want the x-ray beam to come in perpendicular to the object in the film to get less distortion. If you have too high vertical angulation, you'll have distortion. Too low vertical angulation, you'll have distortion. And just for a moment, I want you to think about the two words that we use to describe the image we get when we have too high or too low angulation. If you were thinking of elongation and foreshortening, you were right. So attenuation, process where radiation loses power as it travels through matter, the removal of X-ray photons. So as the energy of radiation goes up, the number of photons passing through matter goes up. And as the density or the atomic number electrons per gram of the material go up, the number of photons passing through the material goes down. These are really, really fancy ways of saying that the more dense that the object is, the less x-rays will pass through it. Okay, so as far as this one goes, if the object is very dense, the material has a lot of electrons per gram of the material goes up, then x-rays won't pass through it. This one is a really fancy way of saying that the more energy or the more power and speed that the x-ray has, the more likely a chance it will have of going through the matter, the object. Elongation, so the central ray is not perpendicular to the object. The object and film are not parallel. You have insufficient vertical angulation. And for foreshortening, the central ray, again, not perpendicular to the film. The object and the film are not parallel. And you have excessive vertical angulation. Um, so with elongation, right, if you are very short, like me, then you will notice that everybody that you look at looks taller. Okay, everybody. I see people and I'm like, I have no idea how tall they are. Like anywhere between five, nine to I don't even know, you all look, you just look ridiculously tall, okay? So if you're short, insufficient vertical angulation, which is my problem, I have an insufficient vertical uh, challenge, then everybody looks tall or long. If you are, if you're really tall, well then I'm, I mean, I'm guessing, but I bet everybody looks short to you, right? Like you probably think that I'm way shorter than I am. So if you have an excessive vertical, then you probably see everything as short. And that's the only way that I can even think of to try to help you remember that. So here again, we have another image of elongation and foreshortening. This is what some of y'all's x-rays look like. I'm not even kidding. Okay, national board question. So both milliampere, milliampere, and exposure time determine what? Will they determine the degree of film fog, the number of x-rays produced, the energy of the, of the radiation produced, or the amount of scattered radiation produced? Take a second. So both milliampere and exposure time will affect the number of the x-rays that are produced. Film fog, this has to do with storing it in um, like a room that has chemicals or if like there's backscatter uh, where the, you know, the scattered photons come back around and like go back to the film. That's why there's lead foil inside the film. Um, so this one, definitely not. The energy of the x-ray of the radiation produced, this one is from KVP. And the amount of scattered radiation, this has absolutely nothing to do with milliampere and exposure time. Um, scattered radiation is going to happen no matter what you do. So number of x-rays, the, the with milliampere, with this one, we're heating up the tungsten tar, the filament that's inside the cathode more. So we're going to cook off more of those electrons and that's going to increase the number. And then for exposure time, if we're, you know, holding the button longer, then we're going to definitely have more uh, x-rays that get produced.
Next question is, which of the following describes a radiographic film that has many graduations of gray, from totally white to totally black? And here we're looking at either overexposed, underexposed, low contrast, or high contrast. The answer is going to be low contrast. If it has a lot of gray, then it's going to be low contrast. Sharpness of the radiographic image is increased by using a smaller focal spot, decreasing the focal spot object distance, decreasing the MA, increasing the object film distance, and using screen film technique. The answer is going to be using a smaller focal spot. All right, x-ray machine, we're going to talk about what it is made of. First is the glass vacuum tube, and in this there is no air. That's why it's called a vacuum tube. There's no air inside it. It is surrounded by um, the electrodes of the x-ray tube. I'm sorry, it surrounds the electrodes of the x-ray tube to provide a vacuum. The aperture, or the window, is a thin segment of the glass that allows maximum emission of, emission of x-rays and a minimum absorption by the glass. And that area is this little tiny sort of window right here where the, because this, this part right here is the, the vacuum tube inside here and it's surrounded by all of this oil, right? So there's this little window that allows all of those x-rays to pass through. The leaded glass housing is what is going to prevent x-rays from going in all directions. The x-rays can only leave the uh, tube by the little window. Inside the x-ray machine, there is the cathode, which is negative. It serves as the source of electrons. And those are negative because electrons are negative, uh, and they get directed toward the anode. And it is composed of the filament, which is made of tungsten wire, it is a filament that lies in a focusing cup and it, um, it has electricity passed through it, which heats it up. And that heat is what is going to cause those electrons to break off. Um, and this is called thermionic emission. Uh, the focusing cup, this is where uh, the electrons are sort of directed in which direction to go with the cup. Um, is what the MA control, uh, that's what it's going to do. So if, if you raise the MA, then you're going to increase the temperature of that, uh, well, the increase the amount of electricity that's traveling through the filament wire, which is going to make it more hot, which is going to cause more electrons to collect there and be focused over towards the anode. Um, the cup, um, is made up of, uh, you can say either molybdenum, which is how I think of it, or I've also heard it said molybdenum. The MA is going to regulate the step down transformer. So the electricity, when it enters the x-ray machine, it has too much power. And so it requires a step down transformer before it will go into the filament. Otherwise, it would be like a light bulb that has too much electricity going to it. It would just pop, right? And it, would, it wouldn't work anymore. Um, so it has to step down that electricity in order to be more manageable for the filament. It's gonna heat up the filament and that is going to cause more of those electrons to be boiled off, or I think of it as like cooked off, um, when it is creating the number of electrons. Because the charges repel, the electron beam is directed toward a small area on the anode. So then we move over to the anode, which is positive, and it is composed of a tungsten target um, tungsten is actually the element that is used here because it has a high atomic number. And that's not really, that's just a fancy way of saying that, you know, it has a lot of electrons and a lot of protons uh, within each atom of tungsten. Um, it also has a copper stem. Um, and so the copper stem is going to be used to sort of filter away some of that heat that's going to be created when those electrons are forced over and collide with the, um, the tungsten part. The focal spot is the portion of a target that is going to be bombarded by the electrons. So how big that tungsten target is, is going to determine the focal spot size. 
that is going to convert those electrons um, that are being sent over into photons. The kilo voltage control regulates the step up transformer, the voltage between the cathode and the anode, and the accelerating potential or the speed of the electrons. So the more we raise the kilo voltage, the more um, those electrons, like the, the power with which they're sent from the uh, filament over, that is going to increase speed. Moving on to the focal spot, so the sharpness of the radiograph will increase as the size of the radiation uh, source decreases. In other words, as the tungsten target gets smaller, the sharpness of your radiograph will go up. The heat also will go up as the focal spot goes down in size. So that's an important factor in us. We don't want it to be too small because then it's gonna create a lot of heat. Uh, power supply has Ohm's law. This is where volts, uh, which volts are calculated by amperes uh, times resistance. Uh, that's how we figure out uh, about volts, and that is known as Ohm's law. Um, you know, you don't have to memorize all of this perfect or become an expert, a subject matter expert, but um, you know, just look at it, and and it'll be there. It's in there. So then, when you take the test, you will be able to recognize some of this. It won't be the first time you've seen it, and you'll be able to make a more educated guess. Okay, don't get too stressed out by seeing something that you know you weren't specifically taught. I can't can't teach every single thing about every single thing. It's too much. Voltage equals key kVp. So kilo voltage potential, right? Increases the potential differences between the negative and the positive, and therefore the speed or the force of the moving electron toward the positive charge, right? So voltage or kilo voltage is going to, uh, I'm sorry, I said kilo voltage potential. It should be kilo voltage peak. Um, it is the, the speed with which the electrons will be forced from the cathode over to the anode. Inside the x-ray machine, they have a power supply, right, which comes from the wall. Uh, and there are transformers, which will change the potential difference of incoming electric, uh, of electrical energy to any desired level. It's going to provide low volt current to heat the filament by use of a step down transformer. This is going to be regulated by the milliampere switch. It's going to adjust R and therefore current flow. It regulates the temperature of the filament, which is going to affect the quantity of x-rays. If basically you understand that the MA switch controls the step down transformer and that controls the quantity of x-rays, then you, you probably have all that you're going to need. The step up transformer is going to increase the voltage sufficiently to propel electrons across the vacuum tube circuit to produce x-ray energy. So this is all about the speed. It's going to generate high difference between the cathode and the anode. It's controlled by the kVp um, and select varying voltage controls uh, between the anode and the cathode. The more voltage will equal the more speed of those electrons traveling toward the anode. Also part of the x-ray machine is the PID, or the position indicating device. It is open-ended circular or rectangular cone, although they don't call it a cone anymore, that extends from the tube head toward the image receptor, right? It's the little part that you point when you are adjusting. The federal regulations require that the um, opening of the, the PID be 2.75 inches in diameter because this is approximately uh, bigger than the size of the receptor and that's important so that we don't have to take as many retakes. The length of, uh, the, length of the PID is going to increase the focals uh, to object distance which is going to create a less divergent beam. So the longer the PID is, the better because it's going to increase your focal to object distance, which is going to help you to reduce magnification. Uh, the use of the fastest, fastest image receptor, speed F, uh, is going to require the least amount of radiation to produce a diagnostic image.
longer PIDs will produce an X-ray beam that is less divergent, and it's going to decrease radiation exposure, and it's going to provide a better image resolution. So the National Board question, the federal guidelines limit the size of the intraoral X-ray beam at the client's skin to um, one and three quarter inches, two and a half inches, two and three quarter inches, three and a half inches, three and three quarter inches. So this requires that you be somewhat decent at converting fractions over into decimals, although not terribly proficient at it. Um, so then the answer is gonna be two and three quarters because two and three quarters inches is 2.75 inches. Which of the following position indicating devices or cones best minimizes the dose of radiation to the patient? Is it going to be a pointed one, that's plastic, a leaded circular one, or a leaded circular one, or open-ended circular, or leaded rectangular? The answer is going to be open-ended circular. Which of the following causes unnecessary secondary radiation to the patient? Uh, speed D film, plastic pointed cone, KVP under, 20, uh, under 70, aluminum filtration over 2.0 millimeters, or short eight inch target to film distances. So here you're looking at which one of these is the most, right? Which one of them causes the most unnecessary secondary radiation? That one's gonna be a plastic pointed cone. So remember secondary radiation is radiation once it reaches the matter, once it's interacted with matter. And when it goes through a plastic cone, it is going to, one, go through, but it's going to interact with the matter of the plastic, and you're going to get some more secondary or scatter radiation. This is just the image here of the anode and the cathode. We already looked at this a little bit, but it goes through this step-down transformer up here. It goes into the filament. The filament heats up, the electrons cook off, and you can see the little blue electron beam. Um, this red section here, this is the it's filament focusing cup, right? It's also the molybdenum cup, which is going to focus all of those electrons over to this little blue section here. This is the tungsten target that's inside the anode. And this is where all of those electrons are going to collide. And that collision is what is going to create the Bremstra lung or the breaking radiation. The collision here is what's going to create that energy. And then these little red lines down here, those are the photons um, that are going to be created. This giant green thing here, this is the copper uh, stem, which is going to help reduce or divert away that heat energy that is also going to be created during this process. Uh, and then all of this stuff around here, this is all going to be surrounded by insulating oil, which is also going to help with uh, the creation of heat. Factors controlling the X-ray beam is going to be exposure time, the tube current, which is the milliamperage, tube voltage, which is the KVP or kilovoltage peak, the filtration as the X-rays are leaving the uh, tube and the tube head, they are going to be filtered, and the collimation or the collimator is going to help to narrow the beam. So first is uh, beam quality. So the exposure time, the duration of the X-ray production is going to have to do with the quantity, right? And it's going to have more electrons, which is going to create more um, X-rays. The distance, the greater the distance, the less X-rays will reach the film. This has to do with quantity. Um, remember the inverse square law. And then MA is going to regulate the number of electrons and thus the amount of X-rays produced, again, quantity. When KVP is going to regulate the energy uh, or the penetrating power characteristics of the beam. This one is the only one you can see here that says quality. Quality is, um, the, it's talking, when it says beam quality, right, in the last slide, and then this one right here, we're talking about the overall quality. So quantity plus quality uh, of the beam. And this is going to be affected by the uh, having a higher KVP, 
having a higher filtration. Fil um, filtration is going to, you know, reduce all of those slower, um, you know, less penetrating waves. Uh, having a higher collimation, um, which is going to prevent x-rays from leaving the tube in anywhere except, um, you know, where you want them to. Having a higher energy or higher speed of the electron, um, this one is the same as KVP. Having a high film density, so um, this is just going to overall, you know, give you the, the image that you're looking for. And then having a low contrast because you want lots of shades of gray. All right, so x-ray beam quality, kilovoltage peak, KVP or voltage. Voltage is going to be the difference between the two electrical charges between the cathode and the anode. The difference here is going to be determining, I'm sorry, the difference between the two electrical charges is what determines the speed of those electrons when they're traveling from the cathode to the anode. Typically you want anywhere from 65 to 100 KVP when you are taking x-rays. So this part right here, this is the most important part on this whole slide, and it determines the quality of the x-ray production or the penetrating power. When you have a higher quantity, you're going to need higher milliamperage, um, more time, more KVP, less distance, less collimation and less filtration because when you have longer distance more x-rays don't reach it you have uh, more collimation less x-rays reach the patient and when you have uh, less filtration you have more x-rays that reach the patient so in x-ray beam quantity the two main things we're dealing with are exposure time and milliamperage the more time that you spend producing x-rays the more x-ray photons you'll have the longer exposure will also increase density. And this is measured in impulses, which is 1 60th of a second. Impulses, 1 60th of a second. That part's pretty important there. MA is going to regulate the number of electrons traveling from the cathode to the anode. Therefore, having an increased MA is going to have more X-ray photons, right? More quantity. And increased MA is going to have higher density. Um, milliamperage in um, MAs, milliampere seconds, both MA and exposure time have a direct influence on the number of electrons that are produced. When combined, they form a factor termed milliampere seconds, MAs or MAX times exposure time. So MAs, MA like milliampere seconds is MA times exposure time. Distance, the greater the distance from source of radiation, so the x-ray tube to x-ray film, need more x-ray photons. In keeping with the x-ray beam quantity, we're talking about the inverse square law, which I already kind of demonstrated. So the intensity of the radiation is inversely proportional to the square of the distance. Realistically here, what matters is you understand that the further away you get, from the source of radiation, the less intensity you're going to have. So the x-rays, you won't have as many x-rays and the x-rays won't be traveling as fast by the time they get to your new distance. In, you know, opposite of that, the closer you get to the source of radiation, the more intense the beam will be. Um, I you know, already showed you that you just basically take whatever the distance is in the change. So like if you square, if you are you know, doubling the distance or you're tripling the distance, you just take whatever number that is, you square it. So you'll take three uh, squared is gonna be nine. And you're going to make it into a fraction where one is on top. So if you were moving three times the distance away, your beam's intensity would only be one ninth of what it was. The x-ray machine, so the filtration is the process of selectively removing x-rays from the beam, right? We only want to filter out the low energy or the non-penetrating x-rays. The federal regulation requires that you have 1.5 millimeters of aluminum equivalent filtration for units operating below 70 kVp. If you have units operating above 70 kVp, then you have 2.5 millimeters. So in our clinic where we have 60 to 70, right, 
what unit, how many uh, aluminum equivalent filtrations will we have to have uh, because of this? Well, odds are you, we probably have 2.5 millimeters, honestly, but we only need to have 1.5 millimeters because everything we're doing is 70 or below. Collimation is about restricting the size of the beam and the shape of the x-ray beam. So we don't want the x-rays to sort of spray out in any direction. We want them to just come out this one tiny window and go in the one direction that we want them to go in. And so this is going to be achieved by using a lead diaphragm disc with circular or rectangular opening through which the beam is narrowed. It's basically like a lead wind like a lead piece with a small opening in it that allows those x-rays to to go through it's going to reduce the scatter radiation because it's not allowing x-rays of just you know from wherever to go in any direction they want it's going to reduce film fogging as well because x-rays aren't just coming in wherever uh, scatter radiation causes film fog so the focusing cup in an x-ray tube serves to focus the electron beam to serve as the source of x-rays um, is the source of electron to focus the x-ray beam or to adjust the focal spot. And the answer here is to focus the electron beam or the electrons that are cooking off of the tungsten filament and send them over to the anode. X-rays in biology, so x-ray photons are either absorbed and the photons transfer their energy to the patient, or they are scattered, so the photons change in direction, they collide and then they go in a new direction, or they can be transmitted and they pass through the patient unchanged. Dental x-rays will cause coherent scattering, uh, photoelectric absorption, or Compton scattering. So this one here is um, an image of A right here at the top of an x-ray traveling and not messing with the um, um, the atom that it's you know near at all. This is just traveling by, no big deal, right? Um, in B, we have coherent scatter, which means that it travels along and it hits an electron in the new atom, and that new electron is going to travel in you know an um, a different direction. And then C is going to be this new unmodified x-ray. So uh, A, the x-ray, can pass through an atom unchanged and no interaction occurs. Incoming B interacts with the electron by causing the electron to vibrate at the same frequency as the incoming x-ray, and the incoming x-ray ceases to exist. So it hits, the x-ray is gone, but this new electron is traveling on its new path. Um, and then the vibrating electron radiates new x-ray, C, with the same frequency and energy as the original incoming x-ray. The new x-ray is scattered in a different direction than the original x-ray. So here in the photoelectric effect, the incoming x-ray gives up all of its energy to an orbital electron of the atom. The x-ray is absorbed and simply vanishes. The electromagnetic energy of the x-ray is imparted to the electron in the form of kinetic energy of motion and causes the electron to fly from its orbit. Thus, an ion pair is created, right? The high-speed electron, called a photoelectron, knocks other electrons from the orbits of other atoms, forming secondary ion pairs. So in photoelectric, the x-ray comes along, hits this electron, which it gets absorbed by this atom, and then it causes this electron to travel onto a new path. This nucleus, this atom, original one, this one is going to become a positive ion because it's losing its electron, and the electron that runs off and you know goes to mess with other cells is going to be the negative ion, and an ion pair is going to be created. Compton scattering, so this is similar um, to the photoelectric effect in that the incoming x-ray interacts with an orbital electron and ejects it. But in the case of Compton, only a part of the x-ray energy is transferred to the electron and a new, weaker x-ray is formed and scattered in some new direction. The new x-ray may undergo another Compton scattering or it can be absorbed by a photoelectric effect. So Compton scattering, it comes in, um, The this atom absorbs some of the 
energy, right? So that the new, well, once it hits, it loses some energy in order to knock this electron off and trap, you know, send it off on its own path. But then the X-ray is still there. So it's going to travel in a new direction. X-rays in biology, uh, this review interacts, um, review interactions of X-rays on humans, the effect on the oral tissue, effects on a fetus, and effect on the total body. So things like leukemia, cancer, growth and development, and gene mutation. We're also going to talk about osteonecrosis, um, which typically happens with the mandible and the bone that is going to basically die. The bone cells will die and it will cause the mandible to become brittle. Radiation injury. So uh, not all x-rays will reach the film. A lot of them are going, or it says many, uh, many are absorbed by the patient, which we just saw, right? Um, in the ionization, when the x-ray strikes the patient's tissue, it can have little effect on the cells if the chemical changes do not alter sensitive molecules. So if it hits things that aren't radiosensitive, then it's not a big deal. But if it hits things that are radiosensitive, it can have a profound effect on the structures of great importance to cell function. What could happen is the formation of free radicals, and this is a molecule with a single unpaired electron in its outermost shell. It's going to uh, be very reactive and very unstable. That ionization of water is the most common mechanism of damage in humans. Um, so a free radical combines to form with something else, and typically it will create toxin like H2O2. The dose response curve and radiation injury. So what is the level of radiation that is acceptable? Well, the idea here is that no amount of radiation is going to be safe, but that there is a certain amount of radiation which is tolerable um, and our bodies can uh, you know, make up the difference and correct it and, and, you know, heal. And then there is a dose response curve. So the correlation between the damage um, and how our tissue goes about healing it and the amount or the dose of the radiation. So here in the formation of free radicals, um, the DNA is damaged. It creates an unstable pair. And then because it's unstable, it's going to try to bond with other electrons. X-rays in biology, the sources of radiation exposure, there is natural radiation, uh, which comes from background or environmental radiation. It's in, it's in everything. Then there is cosmic, terrestrial, and radon. Um, and then there's artificial radiation, which is made by us. Um, we see this in medical and dental x-rays, mostly, mostly medical. Um, and then it's in wristwatches, uh, TV, smoke alarms, airport security, it's in batteries, like it's, it's in everything. Radiation and biology, so radiographs during pregnancy. Um, the ER uh, emergency treatment can be done anytime. And would um, it's kind of preferable if they aren't having emergency treatment done in their first trimester, but uh, it, you know, it is what it is. You can do it anytime. Then second trimester is the best. So you know, if the pregnant individual is in the second trimester, then uh, less you know, anything could happen to the baby. Um, dental versus background radiation. So just in like living your life and going outside and traveling around, um, in two to four days, you'll get the same amount of radiation you get from an FMX. Um, a bite wing will cause about eight hours worth of the same, well, it, it, boar bite wings will create the same amount of radiation as about eight hours of just living your life. And a panoramic is about eight hours, so. Uh, radiation injury sequence, repair, and accumulation. The latent period or the time from exposure to radiation and appearance of clinical symptoms. So um, from the time of injury, right, which is in x-rays is going to be the time you're exposed to radiation and it causes an injury to the time it takes for the uh, injury to cause a symptom that you see. So like a redness or swelling or a problem. That's the latent period. We deal with the period of injury, right? The recovery period, so cellular damage can repair to a certain extent. We can heal from the type of injury we get. There are cumulative effects. So the effect of radiation exposure are additive, which means that, you know, if you're getting, like let's say you're trying to get second opinions on everything and you go to a new office and you get another 
uh, you get a set of x-rays and then you go to another office and you get another set of x-rays and you go to another office and you get another set of x-rays and you do this every day for probably like four or five months, then you would see a, a cumulative effect of all of those x-rays. Um, somatic and genetic. So somatic cells are the cells in the body except for the reproductive cells. So everything in our body that doesn't affect our reproduction is going to be affected, uh, which will can can reduce your health, right? So, um, you know, too much radiation exposure, typically not dental, uh, can create cataracts or cancer, um, but it's not transmissible to future generations. It's in the same sense of like, if I get my arm cut off and I have a baby, then my baby is going to still have an arm, right? That, that doesn't affect uh, the baby's genetics or the baby's you know, formation. Whereas genetic cells, which are our reproductive cells, ova and sperm, these effects are not seen in the person irradiated, but are going to be passed to future generations. So we see this in the atomic bomb um, survivors of people who were exposed to radiation and they had children and the children had certain um, you know, differences or defects because the parents were exposed. Radiation effects on cells. Um, so cells can be resistant to radiation or they can be sensitive to radiation. And this is typically going to be determined by their mitotic activity. So cells that divide frequently are more sensitive. Cell differentiation, so how immature cells are going to be more sensitive than mature cells. And cell metabolism, cells with a high metabolism are going to be more sensitive. If you think of it like cells that are growing quickly um, are going to be more sensitive than cells that aren't growing quickly, then you'll probably be fine with this, with this area. So high sensitivity um, tissues are going to be your reproductive tissue, your lymphoid uh, or lymphoid system, uh, bone marrow, intestines, and mucous membranes, things that have a high turnover. Medium sensitivity are going to be the fine vasculature, so they're talking about capillaries, uh, growing cartilage or bone, this is more so in like young people, um, salivary glands, lungs, kidneys, and livers. These are medium sensitivity. And then low sensitivity is going to be our nerve tissue, skeletal muscle, heart, optic lens, and mature bone. So um, you don't necessarily need to memorize these, just kind of get an understanding that, you know, certain like low sensitivity ones are ones that aren't growing very quickly, whereas high sensitivity ones are, they do have a much faster turnover. X-rays in biology, tissue and radiation effect. So the hemopoietic or blood forming, um, the reproductive thyroid, skin, eyes, leukemia, mutation, carcinoma, and cataracts. Um, arrange the following cells and tissues from most sensitive to least sensitive. Um, and of these, we're looking at adult bone and nerve, epithelium and muscle, uh, alimentary tract and immature bone, and then blood forming cells and reproductive cells. So here you're kind of looking for which ones are uh, have a higher cellular turnover and which ones have less. And you're just trying to, you know, kind of figure out from there. Um, so you're looking at these to figure that out. And the answer is going to be four, three, two, then one. So blood forming and reproductive are the most sensitive. And then alimentary tract and immature bone. Remember, we talked about immature cells. They have a faster turnover. And then epithelium and muscle, Those are that's a medium uh, sensitive one. And then adult bone and nerve, that one has a low sensitivity. Short-term and long-term effects. So short-term effect is going to be associated with a lot of radiation kind of all at once. The effect that you'll see is nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, hair loss, and hemorrhage. Uh, whereas long-term effects are going to be from small amounts of radiation over a long period of time. And this is going to cause things like cancer, birth abnormalities, and genetic effects. Um, a good example of this would be like um, how we saw like people in early days of radiation, they were exposing themselves to small amounts of radiation over a long period of time. And so people were getting you know, cancer and um, having issues with that. Oral side effects, so the short-term effects 
we're going to see arrhythmia, mucositis, ulcers, and dermatitis. We see this in uh, patients who are receiving head and neck radiation from cancer. And then long-term effects would be the loss of taste, um, xerostomia, because they would have damaged the salivary glands, uh, radiation caries or candidiasis, because they had reduced the salivary flow, which reduces the bacterial clearance, and then possible development of osteoradionecrosis. Um, so this is what we're talking about when we think of like um, people who are receiving head and neck radiation uh, in a treatment to cancer sort of situation. This is not something that we see with normal uh, dental radiographs. Okay, so in this panel, uh, we are seeing an example of osteoradionecrosis. You can see this area right here on the mandible where uh, it, it's clearly they're receiving some type of, of damage here uh, to the bone. And uh, of note, you might wanna notice that the right and the left of this panoramic are flipped. So in this area, they're actually losing bone like in um, 1819 area. Radiation protection, so you want at least a 16 inch PID um, for your target to film distance, 16 centimeters as far as the source to skin distance, uh, 2.75 inches in collimation, so the, you know, the opening where the x-rays are you know, coming out. The maximum permissible dose, this is something we uh, differentiate for people who work with radiation and people who don't. It's kind of a given that people who work around radiation will receive slightly more than people who don't, right? So the occupational and non-occupational radiation exposure, um, there are older units and newer units and you're gonna have to kind of understand both. So in radiation, the exposure to air, this is going to be measured in Rentkin um, or Coulombs versus kilograms. Um, this is what is in the air, okay? So this is not, you know, measuring anything that people are, um, you know, we're not shooting these x-rays, they're, they're in the air. And then absorbed dose is going to be um, in rad, and then the new unit is going to be measured in gray, and the dose equivalent in man or Renkin in man is REM and the dose uh, or the, the new unit is going to be measured in sieverts. Um, typically when we look at um, what we measure, we measure in millisieverts when we are like recording things on a dosimeter. So the old maximum permissible dose for the occupational ones is going to be five REM per year and then um, 400 millirem per month and 100 millirem per week. The old maximum permissible dose for non-occupational uh, doses was 0.5 rem per year. The new maximum permissible dose uh, for occupational is going to be 50 millisieverts per year. And the new maximum permissible dose for non-occupational ones is five millisieverts per year. So before we were, you know, uh, typically what they say is that these two are the same. Uh, anytime that you are, you know, converting, whatever it was here is the same as what it is in Sieberts. It's just a different unit of measure. Um, so before we were receiving, I mean, a significantly higher amount of REM or even, I mean, if we were measuring this, it would be in Sieberts. Um, so here, the fact that we're getting 50 millisieverts instead of 5 rem, we're getting significantly, significantly less millisieverts per year. Um, and a big part of this is because of digital radiation. So filtration, uh, this is going to be done with aluminum discs. It's going to filter out the long wavelengths, the low energy x-rays, and the low penetrating x-rays. The total filtration is going to be um, greater than 70 kilometers, I'm sorry, total filtration, if your unit of uh, your, your machine has higher than 70 kVp, you need to have 2.5 millimeters of aluminum, whereas if your uh, total filtration is less than or equal to 70 kVp, you have to have 1.5 millimeters of aluminum. So our units in our clinic are, they have to have at least 1.5 millimeters. 
collimation. So this is going to restrict the size and the shape of the beam. Uh, the lead plate with a central hole is how it gets out, right? That's how it's collimated. Um, the collimator can be either round or rectangular. The federal regulations uh, mandate that the x-ray beam can be no bigger than 2.75 inches at the skin. And the position indicating device that we typically see anywhere between 8 to 16 inches long. The longer PIDs have less volume of tissue that is irradiated and they have less scatter. So typically, especially with paralleling, we are recommended to use long PIDs. Uh, radiation protection for the patient. We have the thyroid collar and the lead apron. The lead apron absorbs 90% of the scatter radiation that would have reached the reproductive uh, tissues, and the lead equivalent is going to be 0.25 millimeters. So inside your lead aprons, you must have 2.5 millimeters worth of um, lead or a lead equivalent. And then fast film, so the film speed determines how much radiation and how much exposure time are necessary to produce an image on a film. Using a faster film is the most effective method to reduce radiation exposure. So whenever you hear these things like most effective, uh, you're probably going to want to remember anything like that. So using fast film is the most effective method for reducing radiation exposure more so even, in fact, than using a lead apron and a thyroid collar. Film speed determines how much radiation and how much exposure time are necessary to produce an image on a film. Um, so the slowest speed is A, and then the fastest speed is F. The speed is going to double with each letter. So B is going to be twice as fast as A, and C is four times as fast as A. Um, so the national board question here is, uh, with all other technique factors remaining constant, an increase in film speed will increase image density, decrease image density, increase image contrast, decrease image contrast, or have no effects on the image. And the answer is to increase the image density because it needs less time to um, you know, expose or charge those crystals. Using an E-speed film, uh, E-speed group film, rather than a D-speed group film to produce radiograph uh, requires a longer exposure time, a shorter exposure time, a decreased developing time, or an increased developing time. And the answer is a shorter exposure time. Uh, you would still use the same amount of time for developing. Intensity screens, this is, uh, I'm sorry, intensifying screens, this is used more so in uh, extraoral panoramics is where we see it the most. Um, it's going to reduce the exposure time and the amount of radiation that a patient receives. An intensifying screen takes x-rays and it changes it to light, and that light is what is going to expose the film. Uh, Alara is going to mean as low as reasonably achievable. It means that you must do all things within your power to keep the amount of radiation that you expose your patients to, to a minimum. Film composition. So uh, film has a film base, which is a, a flexible piece of plastic. It has an adhesive layer, which is where the emulsion attaches to the film base. Um, inside the emulsion, this is where the silver halide crystals are actually going to be suspended in this gelatin um, stuff. Um, and so the gelatin holds the silver halide crystals on there, um, and the adhesive layer holds the film emulsion onto the piece of plastic. Um, the silver halide crystals are what get charged, and they are what is sensitive to radiation. And then there is a protective layer um, around the emulsion. The latent image formation, so the idea here is that you take an x-ray and you can't see the image until you process it, right? So the image is on there, you just can't see it yet, and that is latent image. Silver halide crystals, they absorb the x-rays, uh, they absorb the energy from the x-ray photons, and they store that energy, various amounts of uh, stored energy in different areas, right? Some areas would have gotten more x-ray energy to them in the areas you know, that were able to pass through those structures. So those areas will turn black, whereas other areas that got less 
radiation, uh, they won't turn black. Um, and there is an invisible pattern of stored energy called the latent image. Film size. So in um, sizes, you're going to use a size zero in order to take bite wings or PAs in small children. You'll use a size one to take PAs on adult teeth, or you can use a size one to take bite wings in kiddos. Uh, you can use size two to take PAs on adult teeth and bite wings on adult teeth. Size three was made for bite wings. They are longer and narrower than a size two, and they show all of the posterior teeth at one time in one image, although it's not recommended we use these because of overlapping. And then size four is used for occlusal films. Extra oral films, uh, we have the panoramic, which show a wide view of both arches and of the surrounding areas. A cephalometric will show a facial profile. We see these in ortho. And then intensifying screens, uh, they're placed inside the cassette with the film. They intensify the effect of the x-rays on the film. And in doing that, they actually will reduce the amount of radiation that is required, which is why we saw before um, X, a panoramic is slightly more than four bite wings, but it's less than an FMX. Manual develop for film processing. So the process here, remember the dipping tanks and they have the little clips that hold the film. Uh, first, you're going to dip it into the developer or the development. Then you have to rinse it off. It's going to remove the developer, which is important because if the developer stays on too long, your image turns too dark. Then you put it into the fixer and it gets fixed, <laughs> fixation. And then uh, you have to wash off the fixer, which is going to remove excess chemicals, and then you dry it. Uh, so the developer is going to precipitate all of the silver. Precipitate is the word that x-rays use to um, talk about the change that happens when you expose energized silver halide crystals to these chemicals. So it precipitates. Um, all of the silver in those silver halide crystals that contain a latent image spec that just means the ones that are charged it's going to swell and soften the emulsion that's on the film uh, developer is made up of hydroquinone and elon um, typically what we see uh, is that it takes about five minutes at 68 degrees remember how if your developer is too hot or too cold that's going to affect so we want 68 degrees at five minutes in the dipping tank this is for manual fixer, this is going to remove the undeveloped or unexposed silver halide crystals from the emulsion. So the developer um, made the other crystals uh, change into black metallic silver, but it didn't do anything to the undeveloped or unexposed silver halide crystals. So then once you dip it into the fixer, it's going to help remove those. It's going to shrink and re-harden the emulsion of the film. Um, it is made of sodium theosulfate and ammonium theosulfate. These um, are more acidic, and so you'll typically kind of smell um, that vinegary kind of, of smell. And then uh, there is typically 10 minutes um, in the fixer, which is double the amount of development time. In the developer, the solvent um, H2O will soften film emulsion. Same thing in fixer, the solvent is H2O or water. Um, in the developer, the preservation is the Na sulfite or the sodium sulfite, which protects the um, well, everything from oxidation, but typically the chemical, so we don't want the chemical to uh, go bad too quickly. Um, the reducing agents are going to be um, phenidone, or Elon. I've only ever seen Elon be used, so you're you're not likely to see phenidone. Um, Elon is going to help bring out those shades of gray, um, and then hydroquinone is going to bring out those high contrasts. So all of the shades of black are going to be uh, changed or um, you know precipitated by the uh, hydroquinone. Um, think of it like Elon Musk uh, wears gray. Okay, um, activator, the alkaline pH, um, this is just going to help to speed up the reducing process. And then the restrainer, there's sodium, um, potassium, and then BR. I actually don't know what BR is. These are anti-fog agents. 
um, in the fixer, there's preservatives, so sodium sulfite, again, protects it from oxidizing because the chemical is now exposed to air. Um, ammonium theosul or triosulfate, I said theosulfate earlier, didn't I? Triosulfate is a clearing agent. It's going to uh, reduce or sort of uh, wash away those um, unexposed, underexposed crystals. And the acidifier is the acidic acid. It has a very low pH of 4.5. Um, and it's that's why it, it has to stop the process because we need a certain pH level for the developer to work. And so once we dip it into the acidic bath, basically, it's going to stop the process of the developer. And then the hardening agent um, is the AIK sulfate. Um, CRK sulfate and potassium alum, uh, aluminum, I guess. I don't know. I don't know what that one is. Automatic processing. Um, so in this one, we're, we're running those films through the automatic uh, processor, right? The machine. Um, and so they go through the developer, which is at 80 degrees. Notice how this is hotter, right? It's, it's warmer than the 68 degrees that it spends in the developer for manual processing. And because it's running in at a hotter temperature, it doesn't have to be in there as long. So it only spends about 1.5 minutes in the development. And then it doesn't have to have a rinsing step because the rollers inside the automatic processor will help to sort of wring out all of the developer that's on there. It goes directly into the fixer. Uh, it spends about 1.5 minutes in there as well. Uh, the fixer will stop the development or uh, the developer from working. It'll, you know, stop that process. And then it goes into a water bath to wash away all of the chemicals for about 30 seconds. And then it goes through a drying sort of part where there isn't any liquid. It just sort of wrings out the liquid um, and it's going to dry it off. It takes about 30 seconds. So all in all here we see this is four minutes. Um, I mean, if you've been standing next to a processor, it probably takes anywhere from four to six minutes to to you know, pop the films back out for you. Radiographic images that are too dark are the result of all of the following except one. So an overdevelopment, film fog, non-exposure to x-rays, hot temperature of solution, or overactive chemicals. And so non-exposure to x-rays will actually not create your image to be dark. You won't get an image at all, but um, your, your film will actually come out completely clear because none of your crystals got exposed, none of them turned into black metallic silver, and so all of them got washed away in the fixer. Overdevelopment, this is, it spends too long in the developer, it'll turn too dark. Film fog, if it you know is exposed to any number of things that cause film fog, then it will come out too dark. Hot temperature, so we saw you know it takes less time if the if the developer is warmer. Um, so if the if the developer is too hot, it's going and it stays in the developer for the same amount of time, it's going to be in there too long. It turns black. It turns darker. And overactive chemicals. Um, so. Which of the following are purposes of the fixing solution in processing radiographs? So do we need to uh, soften the emulsion, harden the emulsion, develop exposed um, silver halide crystals, or remove undeveloped silver halide crystals? Here the main word you're looking for is what happens in the fixing solution. Uh, so is it one and two, one and four, two and three, two and four, or three and four? And the answer is two and four. The fixer will harden the emulsion and it will remove undeveloped silver halide crystals or salts. Why does it say salts? Why does it have to be like that? Uh, a major difference between automatic and manual processing of radiographs is that automatic processing is more expensive. It provides better quality films, allows more latitude in exposing techniques, or requires special solutions at higher temperatures. So what's the difference? It's going to be D. It requires special solutions at higher temperatures um, because it, it has to be higher temperature in order for it to work faster. Excuse me. So uh, in a dark room, we need to make sure that we have light tight. There's no white light coming in and all of the light that's in there is going to be safe light. So you have to use a low wattage bulb, right? So you're probably sitting, uh, you know, you're not you're not using a 100 watt bulb. 
um, the safe light filter is going to remove the short wavelengths. And this is going to be all of the blue and green. It's going to, however, have red and orange light that is not going to expose your film. Um, and so, you know, whenever you watch movies and you're in a, like a photography room, it's always like that red light, right? That's why. Um, the minimum of four feet from the film and from the working area. You don't want the light, even though it is, you know, filtering out those short wavelengths, you want it to be further away. It can still cause film fogging with a long exposure. So if you were to sit it out and just leave it out, it would still cause film fog. Um, all right, so let's talk about film processing. Underdeveloped is going to give you a wider image. It didn't sit in the developer long enough, and so it didn't get all of those charged crystals to turn darker. Whereas overdeveloped is going to, um, well, it's gonna turn too much stuff dark, and so it's gonna come out overly dark. And then underfixed is going to give you a cloudy or a yellow brown sort of color. Underdeveloped films, um, the film is going to appear really light. It's going to have an inadequate development time, or it could be too cold of a solution. It could have a depleted or contaminated developer solution. So in the, in the, um, like, remember how we talked about how it has a sodium sulfate in it, which helps to prevent oxidation, and it's a preserver for the solution? Well, if the solution sits out in the oxygen too long, eventually it will become oxidized, and so it won't work as well anymore. So um, you have to replenish or replace your fluids um, at certain intervals. And then overdeveloped, the film is going to appear too dark. It has excessive uh, development time or temperature, or it can be have a concentrated developer solution, something that should have been uh, watered down, didn't get that way. Reticulation of emulsion, so the film will appear cracked. Uh, the problem with this is if there is a sudden temperature change between the developer and the water bath. So it's really important that all of your sort of dipping tanks stay in that like overall water sort of sink um, that is all at the right temperature. Chemical contaminant errors, there could be developer spots. This happens uh, whenever you splash developer onto the counter and then you set your films down on the counter. Uh, fixer spots will happen. Uh, they're going to look like white spots on the film, right? This is before the processor, uh, or before the film goes into the developer. Fixer gets splashed. If it's like kind of splashed onto the counter, then you're gonna have white spots. Air bubbles, this happens whenever they uh, dip the film down into any of the chemicals. Uh, typically it's the developer. And then when you dip it down in there, you have to agitate the film and like shake it just a little bit so that the bubbles will, you know, not be stuck onto the film. Um, and then yellow brown stains, this is typically caused from inexhausted chemicals, uh, insufficient rinsing or incomplete fixation. Air bubbles look like this. Uh, you can see it. I mean, I, you might be able to see it. It looks like this thing right here. This is air bubbles. Yellow brown stains. That's a given right there. Uh, film handling errors. So overlapped films. This happens when you are running them through the automatic processor and you run them too, too quickly through the automatic processor. Um, I mean, this is what happened when I was trying to run like a hundred something films through the processor one day. Um, you'll get white or black areas on the film depending on if, uh, you know, they got stuck in the developer or they got, you know, overlapped in the fixer. And then static electricity. This is a thin black branching lines. It kind of looks like a, either a lightning bolt or a sort of tree branch that happens on your film. And this occurs when the packet is opened quickly. So if you open your packet and you jerk that film out of the packet, it's going to create static electricity. Um, that looks like that. And then a slightly bent film. So this is going to give us the image of elongated roots. And the film can be bent to accommodate the patient's anatomy, such as areas of the uh, anterior maxilla. Um, you know, this is what happens if the patient bites and the film kind of flexes a little bit inside there. And then you take the image. A severely bent film is going to have a diagonal black line. This is when, you know, the, the person taking the x-rays probably tried to just um, like bend the corner so that it would be more comfortable for the person. So static electricity, it looks like this. Um, this one, 
I mean, I'm guessing that it was a combination of a couple of things. Um, so it's probably movement because everything looks really blurry. But also, I think that the film was slightly bent whenever they tried to take this image. Um, and so the instead of being, you know, straight, the film probably looked kind of like a C and they took that image anyway. This one. Um, so here, my guess is that the patient had a very narrow palette and they tried to take the image anyway and the film was just kind of bent in there. This one, they bent the corner of the film uh, and that's why you see that big black uh, line right in the corner um, to try to accommodate the, the film for the person. Um, this one, so what we're seeing here is foreshortening. Um, the you know, roots of these teeth look really tiny. And this happens because of excessive vertical angulation. So if you have too much, your, your angulation is too tall, then your, short, your roots will look short. Film handling errors. So there's artifact, uh, a, nail, a fingernail artifact is going to look like a black crescent shaped mark uh, because you're going to damage the emulsion with your fingernails when you are pulling it out of the, the film packet, right? So um, a good way to not do this is to one, have your fingernail short because you're a hygienist, but also um, because you, you're careful, you're only touching it on the edges um, and you're wearing gloves, uh, will help to protect your film from getting fingerprint artifacts. Um, you'll see it looks, like, it looks like a fingerprint right on the film. And that's what happens when you don't wear gloves and you touch the flat parts of the film. You always wanna pull it out kind of like a picture where you only touch the edges. And then a scratched film. So this is where it gets little white lines on the film. Um, and what happens is if you scratch the film with either like maybe the corner of the, the packet or if you've got something sharp inside the, the processor or the daylight loader or in your, your dark room, then um, you're going to remove the emulsion in that area and then it won't turn black. Uh, roller marks. So this happens if you're not cleaning the rollers consistently. Um, you know, they do pick up dirt and debris and um, then you'll, you'll see it on your image. So this is what roller marks look like. You can see these kind of um, sort of black lines running this direction here. And then uh, light leaks. So in your dark room, if you have a light leak, you'll see an exposed area on your film that will appear black. So um, if you have like a, a major light leak, then your whole film will be black. But sometimes, you know, you're, you have a little bit of a light leak in a certain area and so you know by the time you stick it into the processor or you dip it down into the developer then only a certain section of it will get exposed uh, fogged film so this will appear gray and lack image detail and contrast um, improper safe light will create fogged film outdated films uh, you know so if the the film is expired you should not use it improper film storage so if you are keeping your film in the same area where you are keeping the um, chemicals, the chemicals will cause fog, and then a contaminated solution. So, if, you know, if you put, um, you put it into the developer and then it has like fixer or some other type of chemical in the developer with it, it's going to be contaminated. It's not going to properly develop your film. Operator errors. Um, so the patient not biting down all of the way on the block, you'll see a big airspace uh, in between the teeth where they're supposed to like on a bite, uh, and, and a bite wing, or you won't see the apices if you're trying to take a PA. The tipped film, so the images are going to be uh, tipped to one side. Um, typically what happens is the patient bites down on the film and the bite block, and the film inside the bite block gets crooked. And so while your bite block still looks straight, the film inside the patient's mouth is not uh, straight anymore. It's crooked in there. Uh, cone cut, this is when you place the film inside the patient's mouth and then you kind of forget where it is and you point the cone or the PID at the area, uh, but it's not centered on where the film is, it's over to the side. So only part of the part of the film got any x-rays. Um, and then you also have cervical burnout, which can appear as dental caries, radiolucent um, areas, radiolucent artifacts seen in the areas of different densities. Um, now, typically cervical burnout is not considered an operator error. I'm not sure why that's in this category. This is just a natural thing that happens with uh, the anatomy of teeth. 
technique, when it comes to paralleling technique, uh, you're going to be using the XCP or the RIN system typically is the, the kind you're looking for or the extension cone uh, paralleling. You want the film uh, inside the holder to be at a right angle um, or it's also called long cone technique. Um, and the principles here are that the film is placed in the mouth parallel to the long axis of the tooth. So here's the here's the tooth and here's the film and they both are you know running parallel. They never get closer or further away from one another. The central ray of the x-ray beam is going to be coming in here at a perpendicular line and it's going to create a right angle here and it's going to create a right angle here to both the long axis of the tooth and to the film. The film holder has to be used. Uh, there's no other way. You can't get the patient to like hold it perfectly parallel. And then to achieve parallelism, the film should be placed away from the tooth, right? It has to be slightly away from the tooth. Um, you know, otherwise this film would be kind of sitting in here crooked right up against the tooth, right? This is where, um, you know, things are during like bisecting, right? But for paralleling, you want it to be a little bit further away. Um, and because you are increasing the object to film distance, object being the tooth here, because you're uh, increasing this distance, you have to also increase the distance here because this one will create magnification. So the further away we get with our PID, the less magnification we'll have there. So to compensate for magnification, the target film distance is increased. Bisecting technique, this one's totally different, right? This one's the one where you have to use your imagination. Uh, the principles for this one is that the film is going to be placed as close as possible to the lingual surface of the tooth. And then the film and the tooth will form an angle. So this right here is the long axis of the tooth. Maybe I should get a different color because this stuff is in red. So here we have the long axis of the tooth. Whoops, that's a terrible, terrible line. I'm drawing with a mouse. And then we have the film goes in here and these two things form an angle and we have to bisect that angle. We have to kind of imagine where halfway is between the angle and the long axis of the tooth. And that bisector is what we will direct our beam perpendicular to. So when it comes in with the, the beam of the central ray, we're trying to get a 90 degree angle to the imaginary bisector, not the film, not the long axis of the tooth, but the, the line in between. Uh, this one, film holders are optional, right? You can, you can kind of wing it a lot better with this one, but you, you gotta have a good eyeball for it. The bisecting technique, angulation. So for horizontal angulation, you want to position the tube head um, in a side to side plane and you will direct the central ray through the contact areas of the teeth. If you get this wrong, then you will have overlapped contacts. Uh, and I have news for you. It is it, the horizontal angulation is the same no matter what x-ray you're taking. You can use any technique you want, but the horizontal angulation must always be directing the central ray between the contacts of those teeth. That doesn't change. Vertical angulation for the bisecting technique, you want to position um, either positive or negative angulation. And if you get this wrong, you will have either foreshortened images or you'll have elongated images. And so if you have foreshortened, that means all of the teeth look short. It's because you had too much vertical angulation and oppositely, if your images are looking too long, they're looking very tall, then it's because you didn't have enough vertical angulation. Localization techniques. So the purpose here um, is to understand that you have a two dimensional image of a three dimensional object. So you don't know depth. You don't get to see the depth of the items that you're getting. You're just getting a one flat two dimensional surface, right? So as far as things like buckle and lingual go, you don't know unless you use a localization technique. So you can localize, uh, I'm sorry, use to locate foreign bodies, impacted teeth, unerupted teeth, retained roots, root positions, salivary stones, uh, jaw fractures, broken needles, instruments, billing materials, all of those kinds of things. So all of these things, when you take an x-ray, would look, you wouldn't be able to tell exactly where they are. Um, when it comes to the buckle object rule, in this one, you have to use two different images, okay? You have to take them at different 
angles. So the first one you want to take is at a normal angulation. You're going, you know, you're trying to open contacts, all that good stuff. And then in the second one, you're going to change either your vertical or your horizontal angulation. Most of the time, like with the slob rule, right, we're either moving distal or mesial in order to determine. So you change your horizontal angulation. And then in the second one, if the object moves the same direction as you moved, so you took the first one and then you moved distal, if the object moves distal, then it's going to be um, like on the lingual position of the teeth. But if it moves in the opposite direction, so your second uh, film, you moved distal, but the object in the image moved mesial, that's the opposite, then the object is on the buckle. So same lingual opposite buckle. Technique, take two radiographs at two different angles to determine if the object is buccal or lingual to uh, together teeth in the arch. Slob rule, same lingual opposite buckle. The lingual object moves in the same direction as the tube head. The buccal object is going to move in the opposite direction as the tube head. Technique uh, exposure problems. So first you have an unexposed film. This one is going to be completely clear, like we talked about. All of the crystals will get washed away because none of them got exposed. Film exposed to light. This film is going to be completely black. It's not going to have any image on it at all because it was all, all of the crystals got completely exposed. Overexposed film. This is the one on bottom here of these two images. This film is going to appear too dark. It got too many x-rays. And then an underexposed film is going to appear light. It didn't get enough x-rays. So uh, the x-rays never got to quite penetrate through some of those surfaces they would have been able to. If the object film distance was too great during exposure, then which of the following technical errors is most likely to appear on the processed radiograph? So here we're talking about the object to film distance. Are we going to see cone cut? elongation, magnification, foreshortening, or proximal overlapping? And the answer is going to be magnification. So because the object to the film, the tooth to film distance was too much, then we're going to see magnification. The way to correct that would to have been to either one, reduce the object to film distance, move the film closer to the tooth, or we should have moved the PID further away in order to make up the difference for the magnification. Another maxillary anterior PA is attempted by the dental hygienist, and this time the roots of 7 to 10 are elongated. How would the hygienist go about correcting this error? So would we want to increase our vertical angulation, decrease the vertical angulation, increase our horizontal angulation, or decrease our horizontal angulation? If the, uh, if the image is appearing elongated, we want to increase the vertical angulation because with elongated images, our vertical angulation was not enough, okay? We were short and that's why the roots look tall. So in order to correct this, which is what is asking you, the question here is asking you, how do you correct it? We need to be taller. <laughs> we need to increase our vertical angulation. Technique errors, PAs. So uh, we can have incorrect film placement, the absence of apical structures, dropped film corners, angulation problems, incorrect horizontal angulation, incorrect vertical angulation, or cone cut. Incorrect, uh, I'm sorry, technique errors for bite wings are going to be incorrect film placement, incorrect horizontal angulation or horizontal overlap, uh, incorrect vertical angulation, or cone cut. Miscellaneous errors, so we have film bending, film creasing, incorrect position of the patient's finger. Uh, remember the phalangioma uh, is when you can see someone's phalanges inside your image. Um, and then your book was funny because it says that to correct a phalangioma error, you would just have the patient put their finger um, on the inside of the um, the film instead of being on the outside of the film, you know, in between the, the x-ray and the film. Um, or, you know, you could just use a, a holder of some kind and then the patient doesn't have to hold the film. Uh, you could have a double exposure. This is when you take an x-ray with a piece of film and then you don't put that film aside. You actually pick that same film up and you use it again in a new area. So you'll have basically two x-rays and you'll see both images, um, but they're just going to be like 
super exposed or uh, superimposed over one another. Uh, movement is when the patient moves or the tube head moves during your exposure. And then a reversed film, it means you put the film in there so that the white section wasn't facing the tube head. Um, and so your x-rays had to go through the uh, lead foil before it could reach the film. Panoramic basic concepts. So this is going to show a wide view of the upper and lower jaws on a single film. It is an extra oral uh, type of radiograph, which means that the film is going to be outside of the body. It doesn't go in the mouth. Both film and tube head will rotate around the patient. The purpose is going to be to evaluate impacted teeth, to evaluate eruption patterns, growth and development, to detect diseases, lesions and conditions of the jaw, evaluate the extent of large lesions and evaluate trauma. Fundamentals here is the understanding that it is tomography. Remember tomography, how tomo means section. When you're taking a panoramic, the uh, cassette is only going to be exposed in tiny little pieces uh, because the opening or the collimator is going to be a narrow vertical slit. And so only a certain section of the film gets exposed at a time as the film is uh, rotating around the patient's head. So the radiographic technique that allows the imaging of one layer or section of the body while blurring images from other structures in other places. Um, and again, we're putting our patients into the focal trough. This is the area, it's imaginary. It's where we want our patient's arches, their dental arches, to sit while we take that panoramic. So everything we do is about getting that patient into the focal trough. Um, this is the area where the image is going to come out the clearest. Pros and cons of panoramics. So the pro is going to be the field size. We can see a whole lot of stuff, right? Simplicity, it's very easy to take it. You line your patient up, you push the button, and, and it's, not, it's not very complicated. Uh, it has patient cooperation. Patients love panoramics. Um, you know, they, they, it's easy to get in there. You're not putting anything, you know, giant into their mouths. Like, they enjoy it. It has a minimum ex a minimal exposure. So aside from taking an FMX, you're able to see all of the teeth and structures um, without having to expose them quite as much. Cons is that the image quality is not going to be as good. You're not going to be able to get the detail and the sharpness that you're hoping for. There is focal trough limitations. So, you know, if your patient is, um, you know, has more of a narrow jaw or a wider jaw, then they're not going to get into the focal trough perfectly. So uh, we're not going to have the image we want, per se. Um, there is distortion. So because, you know, it has limitations because it's looking at a lot of different structures at one time, we'll see some distortion, right, um, of the image. The, the structures won't look exactly how they, they're supposed to look. And then the equipment costs. It is expensive to buy a panoramic machine. Patient positioning. Uh, so we want them to have a straight vertebral column. It means that we want them standing up nice and tall. We want them to have end-to-end -to -end tooth position. So when they bite down on the bite block, we actually, instead of wanting them to bite in their normal bite, where the maxillary teeth sit slightly in front of the mandibular ones, we want them to bite end-to-end. -end. We want their mid-sagittal plane, which is the imaginary line that divides the face into left and right, perpendicular to the floor. So we want them straight up and down. They can't tilt their head red or left. Frankfurt plane, um, this is the one that your book uses. Remember, I use a la tragus plane or a la tragus line. But the Frankfurt plane is the imaginary line that passes from the top of the ear canal to the bottom of the eye socket. And we want that parallel to the floor, right? And then we want the tongue to the roof of their mouth in order to prevent that air space from creating distortion. Um, this one's funny because it's not even a panoramic, um, but what's wrong with this picture, right? This is him setting up the image, so we don't necessarily want to call him out for being in the room while he takes the image. Um, but what we are not seeing here is the lead apron for this patient. Um, I don't know why that was on there, though, because that was not panoramic, so that should have been like 20 slides ago. Um, so ghost image, this is a radiopaque artifact that's seen on our panoramic film. The idea here is that the object from somewhere else is going to be 
penetrated twice by the x-ray beam, so the image is going to show up somewhere that it doesn't belong. It's seen on the opposite side of the film. So if the patient is maybe wearing earrings, we won't see the earrings in the ears where we see where we see ears. We'll see the earring uh, image show up somewhere else. Um, usually it's indistinct and it's larger and it's higher. The reason it is larger is because um, you know it has to travel through some space before it gets to the film. So the distance, remember magnification, the further away the object to film is. And then the other thing here is it's going to be higher because the x-ray tube head actually passes around the back of the head at a lower uh, angle. So it's going to be kind of pointed up a little bit. So that's why we see it um, higher. Common errors is going to be the lip and tongue positioning. We forget to tell our patients to close their lips and forget to tell them to put their tongue to the roof of their mouth. Their lips need to be closed or else it will give us a dark shadow that's going to obscure uh, their front teeth. And then the tongue against their palate, this gives us a dark shadow which is going to obscure the apices of their maxillary. Common errors are going to be the Frankfurt plane, not lining that up, right? And when we see this, their chin is either too high, and we'll see a reverse smile line, um, which is a downward curve. The maxillary incisors will be blurred, and the condyles, so the mandibular condyle, will actually be off to the side of the image where it's we might not even see them. Um, or we could have the chin tilt to too low. So the Frankfurt plane is too low and it is um, an exaggerated smile line. They're gonna look like a, like a jack-o'-lantern or the Joker, right? They're going to have curved upward. Uh, the mandibular incisors will be blurry. The condyles may not be visible. They might be completely off the top of the image. This is what that looks like. So uh, in this one, the chin was tipped down too much. And so uh, you can't even see the mandibular condyle on the, uh, the left side, it's too high up. Common errors for uh, positioning the teeth. So in this one, they can be too far forward. If they're too far forward, they're going to be uh, too skinny and out of focus. Whereas if they're too far back, then the teeth will look um, too fat or out of focus. Uh, I, I would think of it, they're kind of wide. Um, in the mid-sagittal plane, if the head is not centered left and right, one side of their back teeth is going to appear smaller than the other side. So one might even be uh, you know, in focus and the other one is not going to be. Um, and the position of the spine. So the patient's spine has to be straight um, or else it's going to hit them in the back of their neck. And we're going to see that radiopacity in the center of the film if they're not standing up straight. Uh, the definition here of the different types of bone that we're looking at is going to be cortical or compact bone. Um, this is the, it should say dense, not sense, uh, dense outer layer of bone, and it's going to be radiopaque, right? Radiopaque is white. Cancellous bone is that soft, spongy inner bone. This is composed of those trabecula that form a lattice-like network of intercommunicating spaces that is filled with bone marrow and nerve and blood vessels and all of that good stuff that travels through the bone. Um, I think of, you know, Alex Trebek asks a lot of questions. There's a lot of little networks inside uh, the bone. And I think of it as like a lacy sort of texture, not like a lattice. Um, you know, I'm not a gardener, so I guess that's why. Definitions uh, of certain radiographic terms. Uh, prominence is anything in bone that kind of sticks out, right? So process is going to be a marked prominence or a projection. Uh, a ridge is going to be linear prominence or projection. A spine is going to be a sharp thorn-like projection. A tubercle is a small bump or a nodule of bone, the same way we see the lip tubercle is kind of the area in the middle, the small bump of the upper lip. The tuberosity is a rounded prominence of bone. We see that on the maxillary uh, arch in the back behind the tooth. Definitions of depressions. So we see a canal is a tube-like passageway through bone that contains nerves and blood vessels. The foramen is an opening or a hole in the bone that permits the passage of nerves and blood vessels. Those are important. Fossa are areas um, that are 
excuse me, broad, shallow, scooped out or depressed areas of bone. Um, we see these in like the, you know, nasal fossa. Uh, sinus is a hollow space, a cavity or a recess in bone. So the maxillary sinus. Uh, miscellaneous here is the words like septum. So septum is a bony wall. I don't know why they spell bony that way. That's um, that's not right. And then or a partition that divides two spaces or cavities. Most of the time you think of like the nasal septum. So if you have a deviated septum, then you know your your septum isn't in the middle or it's you know it's not functioning like it should. Um, and so nasal septum is kind of the the main one here. Uh, but you can still find septa, which is the plural form of septum, um, in the maxillary sinus. Suture is going to be an immovable joint that represents a line or a union between adjoining bones of the thin of, of the skull, so a thin radiolucent line. In our x-rays, we see this as the uh, median palatal suture, where the two palatal bones and the two maxillary bones fused together right in the center of the, the patient's, uh, their palate. Uh, landmarks we're looking for of the maxilla are going to be the incisive foramen, or it's also called the nasopalatine foramen, the median palatal suture, the nasal cavity, the fossa, canine fossa, or sometimes also referred to as a lateral fossa. It's the sort of scooped out area right in front of the canine behind the laterals on the alveolar ridge. Um, the nasal septum is going to separate the two halves of the, the nasal um, cavity, the floor of the nasal cavity, the anterior nasal spine, inferior nasal concha, those are going to look like little blurry uh, sort of seashells inside the nose, um, maxillary sinus or in the floor of the maxillary sinus, the maxillary tuberosity, the hamulus is going to be this small little projection right behind the maxillary tuberosity, um, the zygomatic process of the maxilla is going to be that U or J shaped uh, radiopaque structure right above the maxillary teeth, uh, maxillary molars, sorry. And the zygoma is going to be the area behind um, the maxillary or the zygomatic process. Landmarks of the mandible is going to be the genial tubercles which are the uh, sort of little projections around the lingual foramen um, in the uh, center of the bottom um, for the, the lingual foramen. And then the nutrient canals are like the little areas that travel up from the mandibular canal up to each of the apices of the teeth. The mental ridge, the mental fossa, the mental foramen. Anytime you see the word mental, you need to be thinking of the word chin. The mylohyoid ridge, which is also called the internal oblique ridge. The mandibular canal, the internal oblique ridge, the external oblique ridge, uh, submandibular fossa, and coronoid process. I mean, we're going to look at each one of these. Um, landmarks of the pano. Here we're looking at the mastoid process of the temporal bone, styloid process. Um, styloid process and the hamulus are often um, confused for one another. So if you think of the hamulus as being right behind the maxillary tuberosity, that is where that is. Um, but the styloid process is the um, sort of like projection coming off of the um, uh, one of the pterygoid plates. It's, it's way further back behind the ramus. And then the external auditory meatus is the opening for the ear, the glenoid fossa, uh, articular eminence, maxillary tuberosity, infraorbital foramen, orbit, incisive canal, and foramen, anterior nasal spine, nasal cavity or septum, uh, hard palate, maxillary sinus, zygomatic process of the maxilla, zygoma, and the hamulus. Landmarks uh, for the pano for the mandible are going to be the mandibular condyle, coronoid notch, coronoid process, mandibular foramen, the lingula, the mandibular canal, the mental uh, foramen, hyoid bone, mental ridge, mental fossa, genial tubercle, inferior border of the mandible, the mylohyoid ridge, internal and external oblique ridges, and the angle of the mandible. Uh, also with a pano, we see air spaces. So we're going to look at those, the palatoglossal airspace, nasopharyngeal airspace, glossopharyngeal airspace. Okay, so um, number one down here, this is going to be, let me pick a color. 
This one down here is pointing at the lingual foramen. You can see that there. And then what's nice is that it's got number twos kind of pointing at all the ones around it because it's clearly not talking about the radio lucent area here. It's talking about the radiopaque surrounding structure there, which is going to be the genial tubercles. Remember, I think of them as like little happy surfers, right? Hanging out. They are where the muscle of the tongue get to attach. Um, number three, that is a three unit bridge. That's what that's pointing at. Number four is going to be the hard palate. So this structure as it travels all the way across all of this is the hard palate. And if you think about it, it's kind of like the ghost image of the hard palate because it's higher and it's blurry um, and it has some magnification. So that's that. Uh, and then the next one is the mandibular canal. So we're seeing number five as it's traveling along here, this entire area. It's nice because it has five, five, five. So it's clearly talking about all of this structure as it goes along. Um, number six is going to be the mental foramen. And so you can see that right there in the center. Typically, you'll always find it below these two premolars. So this one you can't see very good on the opposite side, but this one you can. Um, the next one, number seven, that is going to be the maxillary sinus. They're pointing at this whole sort of opening right here. Um, number eight, hmm, there it is. Number eight is going to be the coronoid process. So here you see the ramus, and then there's the sigmoid notch, and then right here you see coronoid process. Is it shaped weird? Absolutely it is. Is this the perfect panoramic? No, it's not. You just have to kind of go with it. Uh, the next one, number nine, let's see. Uh, I don't think that's this. No, this is eight. Here's nine. Uh, so in nine, we're pointing at the, um, well, I think we're pointing at this wisdom tooth here, third molar. Yeah, we're pointing at this wisdom tooth. And then number 10, we are pointing at the mastoid air cells. Hmm. I don't know about that one. That's the one your book says. Uh, number... 11. This one up here is talking about the articular eminence. So you know how the coronoid, uh, I'm sorry, the ramus, I'm sorry, the condyle sits in a, a, a groove on the temporal bone, right? Well, the little part right in front of it, this bony protuberance here, this is the articular eminence. Number 12 is going to be the pterygo maxillary Fisher. So this is going to look kind of like an upside down teardrop shape. And it's going to be right here in front of the articular eminence, um, but before it gets to the teeth. Okay, this is from the pterygoid plates. Um, the number 13, let me find 13. Um, I don't know where number 13 is. The pterygo, lateral pterygoid plate. Mm, oh, maybe this is 13 over here because it's off the side. Uh, this is the lateral pterygoid plate right here. You can see this kind of structure like this. It looks like this. Those are the pterygoid plates. Uh, number 14, this one is the orbital floor. So we see here this little line. This is where the eye uh, is. And then let's see, is there 15? No, it stops at 14. Okay, that's it. Those are those answers. Okay, so number one, let's find number one right here, is going to be the mandibular foramen. So this is way back here where the mandibular canal starts, that little tiny dark area where the number one is pointing, that is the mandibular foramen. Number two, let's find it. So this one, this is the styloid ligament or the styloid process as it comes down like right this, right? Different from the hamulus, right? And then uh, let's see, number three, I have to try to find them. Uh, so number three is the palate. Again, we're looking at this giant whitish structure as it travels along. This whole thing is the hard palate. Number four, this is the nasal fossa. So we can see these guys right here, this entire structure, nasal fossa. Right here in the center, we see the nasal septum. <clears throat> uh, number five is down here. So this structure it's pointing at is the hyoid bone. <clears throat> Sorry, I've been talking for hours now. 
Um, the airspace, let's see, what's the next one? Number five, so that's six here. Oh, in six, they're talking about this airspace right here. Um, and that one is just an airspace. Uh, let's see, number seven, they're talking about this line right here, the one on top. Okay, so this line right here is going to be the external oblique ridge, okay? And the external oblique ridge always starts back here um, on the anterior surface of the ramus, and it stops right here in the maxillary, uh, in, I'm sorry, in the mandibular molars. But the internal oblique ridge, which is also called the mylohyoid ridge, is going to start right here um, at just behind the molars, and it's going to continue down right here. So on this side, uh, we don't see the mylohyoid ridge, but it's this line right here. Um, let's see, number nine. Okay, so in number nine, it looks like we're looking at three unit bridges. You can see this right here is number nine down here. And let's find 10. 10 is over here. Um, so it looks like 10 is going to be the angle of the mandible. Now, do we have an airspace right here that's totally blocking some of that image? Yes, of course we do. But the angle right here of the mandible is what we're looking at. The sort of, uh, you know, L-shaped strong jaw that this individual has. And then 11 is going to be this one over here. And this is pointing at the ramus or this like long section. Granted, you wouldn't have to choose that. Like if it were pointing at 11 and you, you were like, what is it? It's gonna give you choices, right? It's, it's a multiple choice test. So, um, you know, you, you're just gonna choose the one that's most likely, which is the ramus. Uh, let's see, number 12, it's pointing at this structure here, which is the condyle. Number 13 is pointing at this structure right in front of the condyle, which is this section here, which is called the sigmoid notch, or it's sometimes referred to as the mandibular notch. And then number 14, it looks like to talking about this section right here in the front. And so it is talking about the coronoid process. Is that hard to see? Absolutely. But the other choices will clue you in. Um, Number 15 is pointing at this little guy right here in the middle, and that is a retention ortho wire. All right, those were those answers. Moving on to, let's see, this one. Number one is going to be the anterior nasal spine. So this one always kind of looks like a little duck's foot, in my opinion, uh, where it looks like this and it's the anterior nasal spine. Like if this is the back of his foot, you know, and this is like one toe, two toe, three toe, that's that's what I think of that. This space up here, this is what number two is talking about. These are the nasal fossa. Number three, let me find that one. Oh, it's down here. And then so the number three is number 13 with a root canal and crown. Um, yeah, I agree, root canal and crown down there. Number four, is number 14, which has a root canal and crown as well. Um, and so we see these little white lines coming up into the root of the tooth, which tells us that it's filled with gutta percha. Uh, number five is going to be over here. Um, and number five is going to be a crown on number two. And we know it's number two because it doesn't, you know, because of the other teeth, right? And the orientation of it. And number six, let's find, so this is six here. This is talking about the maxillary sinus up here. Um, I mean, technically, if it's asking you for a radiolucent structure, you would say maxillary sinus. If it asked you for a radiopaque structure or a white structure, and it pointed at that area, it might be asking you for the floor of the maxillary sinus. But either way, you're going to look at the other answers and try to you know, figure it out. What is it asking for? Number seven, so in number seven, it's pointing at this kind of area right in here in the middle, which uh, looks like nothing, right? There's nothing there, except for the fact that nothing there means that it's nice, healthy cortical bone, which is full of trabecula. Um, number eight, let's find number eight. Oh, here's seven too. Look at all of these things are just pointing at this nice, healthy bone. And oh, here's number eight at the top. Um, so in number eight, it is pointing at the zygomatic process of the maxilla. You can tell because it's pointing at this U-shaped radiopaque 
structure. Number nine is the nasopalatine foramen. Oh yeah, so here you can see this kind of dark, uh, it, I mean, it looks like a triangle in my opinion, but it's a little dark opening right there in between the two teeth. Um, so in this one, it would be hard if they gave you, you know, nasopalatine foramen or incisive foramen, and they also gave you the choice of that maxillary, um, uh, you know, median palatal suture, right? But it's going to ask you for, you know, a question. It's going to talk to you about, you know, is it a radiopaque structure or is it a radiolucent structure? Um, and it's going to ask you a question about whatever it is. And then it's only going to give you so many options. So you're going to know. And then number 10, let's find 10, is the median palatine suture. So with number 10, they're talking about the line that travels up. And that one, they, I mean, they would ask you and you would choose based on what those other options are. All right, so in this one, we're looking at number one here is first. And you can see this sort of dark area here where it, clearly there was a root here, right? So this was a recent extraction site. Uh, number two, that's this guy. So in this one, we're looking at the implant. Um, you wouldn't necessarily know that it was an implant abutment because uh, like unless you had this image to compare this one to, which you do in this situation. Um, but like you don't necessarily know that it's not the implant body uh, compared to the abutment. Uh, but the question again will clue you in for it. Number three, this is a molar with a root canal. Uh, that one seems pretty obvious. Number four is down here. So this in this one where these little lines, they point actually all the way up here. So in number four, they're definitely talking about the maxillary sinus that is up here. Number five, let's find that one, it's way up here. Number five is pointing at the apex of this root. Um, I mean, I guess you could also say it's like really pointing at the PDL space here, but I mean, it's, it's definitely the root apex. Um, number six here is the zygomatic process. You can see this J shape right here. That is the zygomatic process of the maxilla. And then number seven down here, it is clearly pointing at this bony protuberance on the back of this maxillary molar, which is the maxillary tuberosity. All right, so here with number one, we see this down here uh, and we see it right here as well. Um, we are looking at this radiolucency right there. And uh, I mean, the answer is possible periapical abscess, right? The, the, it is around the apice of that tooth. Number two, let's find it, it is here. Um, and so with number two, it would give you a clue in somehow, right? Like, cause number two and number three are very similar and they're both kind of pointing at the same thing. So with number two, it would tell you, you know, what is the radiopaque structure that number two is pointing at. And then when you're looking at this, you're not like, oh, the trabecula, right? No, that's not it. You're looking at the little line that goes, that the PDL, you know, Sharpie's fibers embed into. And that little line is the cortical plate that uh, surrounds these teeth, which is the lamina dura. Um, um, lamina dura, by the way, lamina means layer and dura means like hard. So it's the hard layer of bone surrounding all of these things. PDL number three, this would probably clue you in somehow as like, you know, where the Sharpie fibers or where the, the fibers live. And it, you know, it's going to talk about, it's going to be a radiolucent area surrounding the tooth and you're going to know PDL. Um, number four, that's down here. Number four is pointing at the bottom of this one right here, and it's pointing at the cortical plate um, or the inferior border of the mandible. So this inferior border of the mandible is made up of a cortical plate. Number five, let's find five. Oh, here it is. So number five, you can see this area as it travels along underneath the roots of these teeth, um, and that is the mandibular canal. This is a big one. So let's see, number one, number one is down here and it is looking at how wide this tooth is. This tooth is not wearing bell bottoms. It has hypercementosis or the cementum that is around that tooth is causing all of this, this area. Um, the way to tell the difference between hypercementosis and um, 
like osteo or condensing osteitis is going to be if there's a PDL space. So if there is a PDL, then it is condensing osteitis, whereas if there is no PDL space, that means it's hypersematosis. Uh, let's find number two. It says the left side of chin rest. I have a feeling, oh, it's this thing right here. There's number two. Um, so that one is left side of the chin rest. That's just where the, the person is resting their chin. Number three, that is this thing right here. That is the ghost image of the right side of the chin rest. So this chin rest right here, number two, is casting a ghost image right here. And this uh, chin rest right here is casting a ghost image right here, if that makes sense. Well, these look like little, little skull and crossbones now. Uh, so number four, this is showing you the earlobe. I mean, it just straight up looks like an earlobe on this one. This is nice. Number five is static electricity. Oh, that's interesting. You don't see that very often in a panoramic, but you can see it kind of looks like a dark sort of branchy little line. Um, and I guess that's static. Number six is hard to find. Oh, oh it's up here is the nasal septum. They're talking about this white line right here. The nasal septum is made up of the uh, nasal bones and the vomer bone. Number seven is the inferior turbinate. Ah, so with in this one, turbinate, they're also talking about the inferior nasal concha, okay? Um, number eight, floor of the maxillary sinus. So in this one, they're talking about the radiopaque line separating the maxillary sinus from the alveolar uh, bone. Number nine, zygomatic arch. Hmm, where is nine? Here it is. Here's number nine. You see how it's much higher up here, right? So this line right here is the zygomatic process of the maxilla. And then this whole section up here is the zygoma. Uh, number 10. Where is 10? There it is. Infraorbital canal. So here they're talking about this part right here where the eyeball orbit separates from uh, this thing infraorbital canal um, so typically there is a canal that travels through here and it will go all the way down from the nasal down towards the um, the incisive papilla here uh, or incisive foramen um, number 11 anterior border of the zygoma interesting i probably wouldn't have chosen that one i probably would have chosen like a septa or something but you won't have septa as a choice so you'll just have to choose uh you know the one that's sort of similar number 12 that over here definitely cervical uh, vertebra the, I, I mean everything here is all just cervical vertebra uh number 13 uh, okay here's number 13 um, and this one says mo amalgam on number 19 so that makes sense i probably would have thought it was a do uh, but i'm pretty sure it wouldn't have given you like mod it probably would have just given you like do or mo separate number 14 is this one right you can tell it is the mandibular canal as it travels all along this area and 15 is the floor of the nasal cavity so oh here's okay um i mean if it gave me hard palate i probably would have chosen hard palate but i guess i could see how this is the floor right here of the nasal uh man i wish there was an arrow there that one's a hard guess but i mean you just kind of use sort of common sense to try to figure out what things are near or what you think it's pointing at it, it'll help you it'll give you clues 